Howdy gamers. So this is the big scary Halo supercut that I talked about at the end of the infinite video. If you've already seen all of my individual Halo videos, there's nothing new for you here. This is just a big three and a half hour chunk of white noise to use in the background. Uh, if you haven't seen the individual videos, please feel free to flick it on and just drown out whatever other shit's happening today. Um, by the time you watch this video in its entirety, I'll be still streaming over on twitch.tv slash infamous sir h because I'm going to play through all of the mainline Halo games barring number five in order without stopping and it's gonna fucking probably kill me but hey at least I'll go out with a bang. Um, that's pretty much it. Enjoy the video and if I see you in Twitch afterwards, I'll see you in Twitch afterwards. Have a good day. November 15th. 2001. A date forever etched into the annals of gaming. I was five years old when this little date occurred. I missed out on the hype train, and I want to say it wasn't till another half decade passed before I even heard of what came out on this almost forgotten but nevertheless important moment in time. The dedicated amongst the audience can probably already guess what game I'm talking about from that date alone. Just calling it a game might be sugarcoating it. It's responsible for launching a console, for modernizing a genre, for laying the blueprint in the past so that others might follow it in the future. This game, this media, this benediction to gaming is now, as of this year, old enough to buy a drink in the US. Get your nostalgia glasses ready. This, this, this is gonna dredge up some memories. Lads, ladies, non-binaries, my dear beloved brethren, I present to you, Halo Combat Evolved. Captain Keys. Good to see you, Master Chief. Things aren't going well. Where do I start with Halo? No, seriously, where am I meant to start? How can I attack this game from an angle that hasn't already been done? There's thousands, if not tens of thousands of written and video based reviews for this exact game. There's plenty of opinions from a wide group of people, newbies, veterans, objective, subjective. So where the hell do I even start with my thoughts on Halo? Well, how about a bit of background? Bungie had developed a few games before making the most important game in the entirety of Xbox's ancestral lineup, but there's three big hitters I'm going to point out. The Marathon Trilogy, a relatively successful Doom clone that looks better than other more infamous Doom clones, even featuring an earlier and much more janky version of a familiar motion tracker. Perhaps even a certain type of gloved hand. <clears throat> It's probably not that deep, but this trilogy is the takeoff point for Bungie's relationship with Microsoft, because while they did make games before Marathon 2, they were exclusive to the Mac OS systems. But looking back through bits and pieces, you can definitely see the seeds of a young Halo steadily being sprinkled here and there. Ideas for Halo isn't something I can apply to the next game Bungie made under the old Windows machine, Myth The Fallen Lords, an RTS, which Feels like a weird sentence to say when you're talking about Bungie, of all people. Hey yo, what the fuck? The last game I'm going to mention is Oni, a third person shooter slash brawler. I'm calling it a brawler because one of its core clutches is a pretty fluid and alright looking hand to hand system, when the game doesn't freak the fuck out anyway. So Bungie has made, while working with Microsoft, an RTS, an FPS, and a third person shooter. 
Can you guess which game went through all three genres before finally emerging as the game we all know? <laughs> to say the development for Halo was turbulent is underselling it, I feel. For the record, a lot of the information I'm about to paraphrase greatly is coming from the Halo wiki, because I trust the people much more invested in the franchise than myself to get the details right, especially when they can cite over 60 sources. The infantile version of Halo began as a sci-fi RTS, a more 3D version of Myth, with extremely prototyped versions of the vehicles we can all immediately recognize. Halo, the RTS, didn't last too long however, as the very young and very small team at Bungie, no more than 15 people by this stage, moved towards a third person shooter, their attention being drawn towards the Spartan super soldiers from the RTS canvas. It should be noted that at this time, Bungie was under the reins of Take-Two Interactive, who had a pretty stable relationship with the old Apple themselves. Halo, still not recognizable as the game I played for this review, was unveiled at Macworld on July 21st, 1999. Don't worry, I can't see shit in this chunky footage either. After Macworld generated a fair bit of hype for Halo, Take-Two invited Bungie to come talk to Microsoft. Considering how Halo as a franchise panned out, it shouldn't surprise you when I say Microsoft quite liked what Bungie was doing. Liked them enough anyway to buy the company and their idea for Halo for around $30 million, just about a year after the Macworld unveiling. At this point, I want to stress that Bungie hadn't even begun developing the campaign for Halo yet. The way Bungie developed their games is counter to how I understand a lot of games are made today. Bungie develops the multiplayer aspect of their games first, from maps to weapons and the like, writing up a campaign and scripted moments last. So when they unveiled their retooled version of Halo at the E3 conference in 2000, just remember that they didn't even have the Halo story ready to go. Hopefully, if I've edited the footage right, you'll be able to tell what parts were cut from the final Jimmy and what was put on ice for later games. It was a slow but hardly steady evolution for Halo to be forged into the FPS we recognize it as today. The organic change from RTS to TPS to FPS came about from the team at Bungie becoming more and more focused on the man behind the gun, that mysterious green trooper in the 2000 E3 footage, although they didn't even have a name ready for him yet. Up until September 2000, Bungie still had yet to tackle the campaign. They had everything else, weapons, enemies, music, an engine to run everything. In the space of a year and two months, Bungie crunched themselves into the finest of pastes to eke out a campaign before Halo hit the market. What a campaign it turned out to be. Right out of the gate, I feel I need to say this. The multiplayer for Halo, especially in the case of Combat Evolved, can't be understated as to how important to gaming it is. Console FPS multiplayer, as a concept that can actually fucking work, owes itself to Halo. This is where having a bunch of prepubescent shits telling you exactly how great your mum is began. This is where a lot of people first experienced the absolute pain of latency and network-based lag. The idea of regenerating shields or health got kicked off with this version of Halo. The limit of two weapons in a first person shooter started here. So if you played Combat Evolved today and think it's just a pretty okay shooter, that's because almost every other shooter that came out after it copied the base template it presented. Although a good 80% of them can't hold a candle to how good Halo actually feels to play. There's a cinematic aspect to the narrative of Halo itself that some games do try and go for, but utterly fail in achieving. Not leaving the first person camera is something that very much doesn't do you favours in that regard. Zooming out, showing the space the cutscene is in, using different camera angles aside from shot, reverse shot. The lighting, pacing of dialogue, blending the music into the right moments. This is all part of a fine blend to sell a good cutscene. I'm not saying that Halo 1 cutscenes haven't been topped in the last 21 years. 
I'm saying that back in the day, there weren't too many games following suit. Even the gameplay loop of Halo has a bit more to it than just shooting the enemy until they die. The balance between Covenant and human weaponry being suited for slightly different purposes isn't something directly told to you, but something you can figure out in your own playtime. Human-based ballistic weapons deal good direct damage to fleshy beings, while the Covenant weapons are excellent at stripping down enemy shields. Then there's the Magnum. This thing is OP as fuck. It's a viable strategy to use one of the smallest weapons in the game in conjunction with something like the plasma pistol to quickly kill most of the enemies that you should fear. I mean, this is a hunter. Very big, very dangerous boy. One that you can kill by mag dumping into their fleshy and exposed back. You can also just one shot them with the magnum. <laughs> This is probably a good point to let everyone know that I played through this game on Heroic, specifically on the Master Chief Collection, but I'm using the classic graphics and sounds because my nostalgia demands it. If there's drastic differences in the gameplay on the MCC and the actual original Xbox copy of this game, I didn't notice them. However, I will say that the remaster itself isn't great. The poster child for this argument is 343 Guilty Spark. The original graphics showcase a swampy level, with the internals of the building being very poorly lit and dripping with that moody atmosphere. The remaster decided to turn the lights on and kill that all-important atmosphere for what is meant to be an unveiling of the big scary enemy in the story. If you like the remaster, my opinion means nothing to you. You don't need to listen to me. I'm just telling you what I think about it. Circling back around to playing the game on Heroic, I feel like it hits a very good midpoint of difficulty. It's hard enough that I found it challenging, but I was never completely frustrated into rage quitting the game. There was definitely some parts that tested my patience a bit more than others, but I feel like that came down to poor game design. Like, who thought this corridor was a good idea? A long, empty corridor with barely any cover. Sure, a skilled player could probably deal with these enemies before their shields are down. I am clearly not a skilled player. While I'm offering up criticisms, the library, what on God's green earth made you think this level in its entirety was a good idea? Bungie, did you just need a spare level to thin out the campaign to hit some hours played sort of goal for the average player? Is that why most of this level is just waiting for a fucking light bulb to open doors for you? Like the library is where Halo 1, in my mind, starts dropping off in terms of enjoyment. From this, absolute slog of a journey to the finish line, barring the final level itself, the game feels so much longer than the other missions. A few of the levels just before the library took me about 20 to 40 minutes to complete, maybe a bit longer if there's some deaths thrown in there as well. The library by itself took me an hour and a half. I could be bitching about nothing. It could just be me being bad at a video game, but I'm inclined to believe otherwise when people who love Halo more than I do can also admit that the library is a fucking shit level. One part I couldn't find too many details opinion on, however, was the overall sound of Halo. When I talk about the overall sound, I don't just mean the soundtrack. We all know that shit is good. I mean the weapon resonance, how chunky they feel, the distinct reports between human and covenant pew pews, how the vehicles hum and have their respective weight or lack thereof, showcased just from an auditory response. Let's start with the assault rifle, all reliable, until you pick up a plasma pistol anyway. An automatic weapon, even a basic one, needs to have a good metallic feeling to firing it. You need to be aware that you are unloading a good volume of hot lead at the enemy because that's the point of full auto, to throw lead at the enemy until they stop moving. <laughs> I'd say the AR isn't too shabby, but it does like a certain bassy punch to the shot itself. That is just me being picky though. It sounds good, and that nice little cocking noise that happens whenever you pull it out in your inventory, nice touch. A better example of what a nice full auto sounds like is the chain gun on the Warthog. That is what a meaty full auto gun sounds like. On the other side of the coin, you've got the semi-autos, which need, in my opinion, to have a substantial punch to them. Because if you're only firing one round, 
That round needs to be powerful. The Magnum does an okay job. It still sounds like a little plinker, which in Halo, it very much is. The sniper rifle, on the other hand. Good one. Nice shot. Yeah, that's good. Probably the one area I feel where the weapon sounds kind of falter is in the explosives. The visual effects are there to sell the explosions, even on the old graphics. And the Hunter fuel rod does sound like a 20 car pileup with no survivors. The grenades, rocket launcher, and even the main cannon on the Scorpion tank all have a explosive sound effect. It just sounds a bit hollow. Like, I'm aware I just fired an explosive. There's a cloud of smoke and fire, and certainly an audio resonance. It's just not beefy enough. This is all just me. What you like in a sound effect is probably different from what I go for. And let's not pretend that we had the same audio tech we do today back in 2001. There's a reason sound cards used to be a big part of building a PC, and why early games came with some very chunky and compressed WAV files. We are very much spoiled for audio these days. Like, the soundtrack of Halo 1, there's a few notes in there that are, and there's no other way to put this, they're iconic. I don't think there's a single person who's played Halo or watched someone play Halo that doesn't immediately recognize that open chorus. Cause let's be honest with ourselves, that chorus is basically the musical motif that lets you know you're playing a Halo game. Martin O'Donnell and Michael Salvatore had the orchestral suite dance when they wrote this composition. It's all the way at the pinnacle for what you can do as a composer. Crafting a collection of songs that people can listen to two decades later and have a flashback of in that moment to when they first heard it. But the broad orchestral suites and thumping drum beats aren't the end of these composers' skills on the matter. You know the mission. When the cosmic horror is unveiled and you're shown a terrifying new enemy that acts completely different to the one you've been fighting for the better part of four to five hours so far. The heightened strings that carry the majority of the song in the background, blended with the occasional high pitch flourish, keep your brain clued in that this is not an epic chase scene type of song. This is a horror track dressed up for an action game. It's not my favorite track though. That'd be the one that goes with the climax of the journey itself. Not only is the fact that there's a lot of this soundtrack that sounds amazing to listen to in isolation, nor that it'll trigger specific memories from when you were experiencing the game, it's the fact that Martin O'Donnell crunched the last stretch of the composition for the Macworld presentation two years before the game itself was released. Even then, he essentially finished the final mixing on the 11th hour, right before the conference itself. Props, lads. You did a pretty good job. The part of the game, however, that's probably the weakest in my mind if we're looking at the game overall, is the story they try to tell level to level. The story to Halo Combat Evolved is okay. Just okay. Don't worry, I can hear the fanboys getting angry too. There's moments in here that I'll remember for a while, only Two of them occur in cutscenes though. There's a whole lot of one other character aside from the chief that I cared about, Cortana, because she's pretty critical to the plot. 
before you graciously and kindly ask me about Johnson. He wasn't even a character in the first game. You'll remember him because he's the most unique voice out of all of the Marines, but he wasn't a character in the story at this point. That doesn't come until Halo 2 and a bit of the expanded universe. As far as Keys is meant to go, he's in a total of three cutscenes before you find his corpse. So I don't really have a reason to feel anything when you punch a hole in his head to progress the plot and destroy the ring. This might suck to hear me say that I think the story of Halo is a bit of a shoulder shrug, a perfectly fine story, an okay journey, a passable experience, but that's just what I think. You might think differently, and that's cool. Sadly, this ain't your video. So when I say I felt more of a connection to Fauxhammer as a character than I did Keys, that's me speaking from my heart. This doesn't mean I don't think there were nice moments inside of the narrative, like the whole opening, with being woken up, the boarding parties, getting to the lifeboat, seeing the Pillar of Autumn stream over the top of you towards the ring, the crash landing, gathering survivors, playing with the Warthog, sneaking onto the Covenant ship, basically up until Silent Cartographer. That whole bit of the game, that's cool shit. Then you get to 343 Guilty Spark, and the narrative very much peaks right there. From 343 to the end of the Warthog run, there's not much in between that I'd call a good story. Hell, Cortana flipping her shit at you when you go to find keys just before 343 Guilty, that's pretty out of left field. I assume it's designed to make the player question what they're getting into and create a small sense of urgency, leading up to the horrific reveal itself off the back of that nice bit with the helmet cam recording. It's just weird that Cortana, the super smart and self-aware AI, wouldn't tell Chief, the cybernetically enhanced super soldier who's pretty much the only hope for humanity that, hey, there's gonna be some weird shit down there and it's not the Covenant. Makes sense in my brain to give the best hope for us Humies a heads up so they can handle the situation properly, because if Master Chief dies, that's a GG for humanity. Doesn't help when that level immediately leads into the library, where you're stuck following a glowing ball around for a few hours, despite there being a ring-wide teleportation network. Why do I need to walk a mile and a half just to kill swarms of flood, grab a large metal toothpick just to be warped back to the control room, and have Cortana bitch at me again for information that we don't know and that she doesn't explain? She instead uses the moment to be sassy and build character before Guilty Spark flips a bitch as well and sets themselves up for a bitch slapping. Although... No one can deny the finality and blood-pulsing nature of the Warthog run, because that is one hell of a way to end a video game. And like I keep saying, there's good moments in here. No one will forget the first time they flew that Banshee. Everyone's recalling pretty much the entire first half of the game. That night mission to infiltrate the Covenant ship and rescue Keys. That moment when you see your first Energy Sword Elite sprinting towards you. The moment when you pick up your first rocket launcher. The moment when you encounter the Flood. The moment when you bask in the glory of the Combat Evolved shotgun. I once said that single player games are a collection of moments. There are some very fine moments in Halo Combat Evolved. I just think the story surrounding those moments is mediocre at best. There's a word to describe Halo Combat Evolved. Foundational. It's foundational to the modern FPS game. A lot of the tropes and cliches we complain about in the average shooter started in this entry of Halo. It cannot be understated how important to the genre Halo is. That's why even two decades after the series began, people still get hyped for the next entry in the franchise. It helps when the catalyst for it all has a solid combat loop that leaves room for the player to learn the subtler ins and outs throughout their playtime. Whether you're playing on easy or legendary, there's depth to the beat for beat combat, whether against the various enemies of the Covenant or from the Hordes of Flood. I mean, even an inflatable paddle pool has depth to it. I don't really need to say anything more about the soundtrack. You know it, I know it. There's numerous jingles in that composition that are forever going to be tied to the Halo franchise. Whether it's the original rendition, the anniversary remaster, or the re-keyed version of the exact song for later entries. Even further down the overarching sound design itself, you can't mistake Halo weapons for anything other than Halo weapons. I don't think there's another sniper report that immediately comes to mind when you say big sci-fi sniper rifle. 
Also, the fucking Scorpion is the best vehicle. It's not even an argument. The narrative to Combat Evolved exists. It is present. You can enjoy it. For me, however, there's not a lot here to really grab. Even in my nostalgia adult state, going back and revisiting the memories of my childhood, the story is still kinda whatever. I only fondly remember the first half of the campaign, and that was reinforced in this recent playthrough. The second half of the campaign isn't as enjoyable as the first. I said it earlier, the library, as a level, is a bad level, and it marks the steady downhill skid of enjoyment, up until you hit the final timer on the moor, and you get to see Echo 419 one last time and make a mad dash for the hangar. Then, and only then, when you make it out, you detonate the core and destroy the ring. You fulfill the final objective. Then you're hit with this little line. Hey look, it's finished. No, I think we're just getting started. Oh, how right you are, Chief. November 9th, 2004. A day remembered by Bungie as the end to one hell of a development cycle and by the fans of a catalytic series as the day of the second win. I was merely eight years old. I remember the day well. I was at school, probably picking my nose or something. Then I heard tell of a new game that the older brothers were playing. I heard murmurs on the win. It's better than the last one, they had said. BXR, they whispered. So I steeled myself and practically begged me mom to take me to the cousin's house because I knew in my heart of hearts that he probably had a copy of the game. That day with that game was one of the most righteous experiences I've had in my life. That game sparked a loyalty to a console I didn't know I had. That game awakened my gaming fire. That game was Halo fucking 2, baby! Master Chief, defend this station. Yes, sir. Right this way. Right, there's another one! That's the way! Move up! Watch it! Like the title said, where do I start with Halo 2? Do I acknowledge that in some areas, Halo 2 is worse than Halo 1? Do I drop the fact that Halo 2 was one of the first games that fully gripped my attention on the original Xbox? Do I mention that the game itself was slapped together and shoddily developed in just about 10 months if my research holds up? Do I merely mention that it solidified Halo as THE Microsoft franchise for the remainder of the 2000s? Well, why not all of them? Because we're here now. Let's start on the development like I did in the last video because consistency. Bungie never actually intended Halo to be the trilogy it evolved into, but after the very overwhelming success of Halo 1, Microsoft was so confident in a sequel that they jumped the gun and said the sequel to one of the most successful launch titles in history would be released in the holidays of 2003. Halo 2 did not release in 2003. Bungie didn't start from a completely blank slate of course, they had several cut ideas that didn't make it into Combat Evolved. One that immediately comes to mind is the Pelican Crash once you arrive on Earth. But it should be mentioned right away that Bungie did almost have a completed version of Halo 2 ready to ship before they scrapped it and started all over again. They modified the baseline engine of Halo 1 and integrated the Havoc physics engine to replace the in-house model used earlier. If you don't know what the Havoc physics engine is, here's a list of games that feature it. Bungie attacked the process with their usual format, which since making the Combat Evolved video has been pointed out to me. The whole multiplayer first, single player second line of development actually started here in Halo 2, not in Combat Evolved, so my bad on that one. The single player is mainly what I experienced. I have some fleeting memories of the multiplayer, like everyone remembers BXR. I mean, it kind of goes hand in hand with Halo 2, let's be honest. 
It's really remarkable to play Halo 2 in the modern day and think, damn, they put through some crunch for this shit and it still turned out pretty good. Let's not pretend that crunch in the gaming industry is anything new or something to be tolerated, but I think it gleams a certain amount of detail on the process when I can find two separate quotes that are polar opposites on that crunch aspect of the game. To quote Chris Butcher, lead engineer, quote, The crunch on Halo was, Oh my god, we're fucked, we're all going to die, unquote. Little bit dramatic to sell the point, sure, but to counter that, here's Jamie Gro Graze Grazemere? Sorry, Chief. Lead designer, quote, If the creative process is easy, it probably means you're not doing anything interesting, unquote. This is the mindset of some of the members of the team that was blitzing to finish up Halo 2 in time for the final holiday season for the original Xbox, and they managed to squeak out the sequel to the most successful entry to a new console franchise to this point. So how did that sequel actually pan out? Like I said, the campaign is my playground. That's my home. I'm not one for multiplayer unless the mood strikes me. And I gotta say, this campaign in Halo 2 shits on Combat Evolve from the get-go. When I was talking about Combat Evolved, I mentioned that I enjoyed the general opening, fighting through the autumn, linking up with survivors, driving the warthog, infiltrating the spaceship, all that good stuff. Halo 2's intro is infinitely better. Not only the lengthy opening cutscene with the heretic, the new suit of armor, how gorgeously cinematic the entire thing is, but the interplay between cutscenes focusing on either main character, the music scored to perfection, the little character actions amongst all the melodrama. You look nice. Thank you! Then the game opens into the first actual combat section and you're immediately given two new weapons to go with. The SMG is nice enough, but the BR. You beautiful weapon, you. Also, let's be under no illusions. The shield in Halo 2 is complete shit compared to Combat Evolved. Never mind the removal of the health bar to give you a generalized indicator how many more nicks and scratches you can take before you just don't get back up again. But just how quickly the shield vanishes under the face of enemy fire. Your new armor shields are extremely resilient, very efficient. So that was a fucking lie. Just like in CE, I'm playing on Heroic, because not only is that the canon difficulty, it's the middle ground of challenge and frustration versus accomplishment and relative sanity. Anyway, to the opening of the game. Cairo Station is a good time, plenty of enemies to render non-combative, a few secondary characters that get killed honorably, shoutouts to Gunny. Call your friends, I got enough ammo for a oh. Rest in peace champion. The new weapons, the new sounds, the new look, holy shit, this game doesn't actually look bad for its age. The textures themselves can look very, very rough upon closer inspection, but the animations of allies and enemies is what makes the whole suite hold up. And then, AND THEN, YOU GO INTO SPACE! This was never in the first game. There wasn't any zero-g sections. This was so fucking cool. And when they do it again when you're climbing towards the Mach gun, oh! Then they casually throw up their hands and say, you know what, we can one-up it. The entire point of Cairo Station was to repel the Covenant, to disarm the bomb they dragged onto the station itself. So when the Master Chief, this seven foot tall motherfucker dragging his balls around says, to give the Covenant back their bomb. This crazy steel clad behemoth of a man grabs his boo thing lets himself get sucked out into the vacuum of space with the bomb he just disarmed and almost single-handedly blows up an entire Covenant capital ship. How the fuck do you open better than that? <clears throat> Sorry, got a bit excited there. The next two levels, Metropolis and Tank Level, are also pretty good and there aren't too many better ways to end a section than blowing up the big scary walker that you've been shown a few times up until that point to be pretty much indestructible. I'm gonna quickly shout out the remaster right here. I thought the Combat Evolved remaster was pretty alright, but the refreshes to the lighting model and some of the cutscenes didn't do that great of a job to enhance the experience. Neither did the apparent changes to the soundscape as I couldn't really detect that much of a difference. The anniversary edition of Halo 2, however, that is a remaster. 
The cutscenes by Blur Studios, who have got a bit of a resume from other bits of good work throughout gaming, they did an outstanding job mapping out the existing cutscenes from the original Halo 2 and remastering them in such a way that it's both an improvement and the outright better version. I love me the old graphics of Halo 2, but the remaster, the remaster, I'd have it just for the cutscenes alone. Now, getting, getting back onto track, once you finish up your dealings as Master Chief, you're unceremoniously ripped from your dwelling and thrown into a new, altogether alien body. In hindsight, the decision to add the Arbiter to the second game as a playable character and then completely abstain from letting the players drive him in any sequel since is kind of strange to me. Like, personally, I think it was a nice little shake up to the established standard of most FPS games, let alone the first Halo, that you stay as the main character throughout the entire campaign. Granted, however, the Arbiter doesn't really have that much of a gameplay difference related to the Chief aside from the lack of a flashlight leading to swapping it out for a cooldown based active camouflage. Which is useful for quickly flanking enemies for a backslap or relocation when you're under heavy fire, but as much as I do like the Arbiter's starting cutscene, setting the stage for an experienced outcast with nothing left to lose, being thrown into a position where their death is all but guaranteed, his opening missions are definitely slower than the Chief's. Not to say that they are bad levels, it does have the tight corridors for an intense firefight and the reintroduction of the Flood. It's also got the Banshee section, which isn't something you had in quite the same quality or quantity in Combat Evolved. It's also got the second biggest set piece in the game, this station you're fighting on. It's hanging above the gas giant in the path of an incoming storm, essentially being held in place with hopes and dreams in the form of this big cable you see here. So you cut the bitch and send the station into freefall. This is a cool little touch that I could extend into the Arbiter accepting the fact he's probably going to die at some point, and the most dangerous type of fighter is one with nothing to lose. It's a nice little touch to the larger level, but it doesn't really affect much. The gravity of the level stays the same, your grenades don't become useless, the banshees don't fly too weird. There's no real sense of danger of running out of time as the station falls into the waiting storm below. I don't know, a big environment change like this? It'd be nice to have it reflected in the moment to moment combat. That said, game was built on a crunch deadline and all that. This is also where you see the next bad bit of Halo 2, the introduction of boss fights. This heretic boss is 1. A bit fucking stupid, and 2. A bad boss fight. Boss fights are a delicate balance to get right, even outside of first person shooters. Making the boss act like a normal enemy with a few fakes roaming around the arena, maybe giving him a little bit more health and shields than usual, isn't a great way to start. But making him seem like a very big silly in the cutscene just before said boss fight isn't a great idea either. This heretic, to spoil the plot, has 343 Guilty Spark from the first game, who's seen as an oracle by the Covenant an all-knowing entity, it's got the answers for their questions about the Great Journey. It's also got the knowledge that could completely expose the Covenant, and the idea of the Great Journey that it was built on, and rip back the curtain on the lie that's been fed to the Arbiter for most of his life. And the moment, right when that's about to happen, the Heretic, someone who would benefit greatly from having someone of the Arbiter's experience on his side, pulls a big dum dum moment out of his ass. This is the moment that I probably should have left for the narrative section, but don't worry. I've got a few nitpicks and glaring criticisms left yet for that part of the video. Hopefully, you didn't think I had nothing but praise for Halo. I do enjoy it. It's got some fine bits. It's also not perfect. The high moments are nice and high, but the low moments are pretty bloody low peaks and troughs, like when you look at an audio waveform. Big Marty and Michael came back for another round on the old Halo mill, and it shouldn't be too shocking when I say that the lads, once again, fucking murdered it like. 
The soundtrack holds the same constant quality and that strange innate memory recall ability to hear a specific tune and have it reach into the banks of your vast memory and pull forth that singular strand you forever link back to the one track in question. And yes, we're starting with the soundtrack this time rather than the raw weapon and level sound design because that's what I bloody feel like doing. Like with Halo CE, there's multiple points I can go to in this long composition and pluck particular songs and live by the statement, iconic, observe. Is this track piggybacking off the memory from the original Halo theme? Yes. Is the guitar shredding done by old mate Stevie an excellent addition to an already good track? Yes. I won't deny for a second that knowing those opening vocals doesn't play a part in the impact of this particular song, but it's the usual expectation for those vocals carrying until the drums come in that is completely shattered by a most excellently calibrated piercing electric guitar. Like, fuck me, just listen to it. <laughs> it's the residual essence of the sci-fi action movie that Halo often is. When the action hits a peak and you feel like a machine of war tearing through every enemy in your path. And then this sort of music comes in to accompany the slaughter. Ah, it's beautiful. Beautiful is exactly how I describe a good half of the soundtrack. Take for instance this other quite popular song. No, I'm not just playing the Halo theme at a slower speed. Ghosts of Reach is a great track to illustrate the contrast that a good composition sometimes needs. No OST, as far as I've heard, can be 100% full tilt all action all the time. Even Doom Eternal, a soundtrack that I hold in some very high regard, isn't always slapping me over the head with deep throaty guitars and a nice mean kick pedal. There's obviously a place for slightly dialed back tracks like Ghosts of Reach. While it does pick up slightly with some good use of drums, the choral vocals are carrying the way and the cadence of said vocals isn't fast enough to make it feel like it belongs in an action scene. It's the build up to the action itself. Don't try and tell me this isn't that last stand type of shit from a movie. I won't believe you. Playing as Spartan 117 used to be something special. There's not a single other soul like you. You're the literal one of a kind. And this song is used in a moment of the journey that is Halo 2 that only a Spartan could accomplish. And it's still not my favorite track of the entire composition. This is the one. When I have my villain arc, this is the track you're all gonna hear for miles. There's something about the constant low, thrumming bass that speaks to me on a spiritual level and says, Go my son, do evil. Like how I think it's criminally evil that the remastered sound effect for the sniper rifle shits all over the original sound. Let's not mistake it, the sound effect for the original Halo sniper rifle from Combat Evolved to 3 is pretty unmistakable. But the remastered sound effect. I'm gonna just play my reaction to it and you'll see how I feel about it. Oh! Oh! Wait, wait, hold on. That's what the sniper sounds like?
Okay, hold hold on for a minute. I'm I'm Keep the ball I'm gonna rolling. need a moment. Yeah, I kind of like how it sounds, eh? That's also pretty much the final mention I'm going to give to the Anniversary Edition. It's much better than the CE Remaster, and adds to the overall experience of 2, rather than spoiling important areas. The sound update and overall cutscene shift is probably the best part, but I'm here to talk about the OG, the standard, the baseline version of Halo 2, because, spoilers, I'm reviewing the series in order, so it makes sense to play the original version to me. There's a few new weapons that have their own unique sound cues, like the SMG has a nice clicky reload sound. All hands. The BR is the BR, its report isn't something I'm ever going to erase from my memory. The Pulse Carbine do go pew pew real nice, because I don't expect much from energy based weapons when it comes to a hefty gunshot. But the best new addition, to my mind, isn't even the fuel rod, which I partially wish had the original sound effect from the Hunter's fuel rod. Nor is it the Brute Shot, that unwieldy grenade launcher, an incredibly accident prone weapon. But instead, the best new weapon is the Energy Sword. I just activated someone's multiplayer PTSD from that one sound. The beam rifle is quite a nice addition as well, especially on Legendary. With that, I've activated another strand of PTSD from Halo 2. You're welcome. Something I neglected to mention in the CE video that I think also makes up an important part of the whole Halo experience and is part of any good shooter, the barking. It's a term for all the in-combat dialogue that both enemies and friendlies can spout off at random. Arguably as iconic as the theme music and the reports of some of the weapons are little lines like this. The Arbiter, I thought he was dead. Hold your fire. Incoming! That was me! You understand what I mean now? The in-game chatter as bullets are flying and the music has picked up. It's an element of the core experience that if you cut out, you would definitely be losing something enjoyable. And enjoyable is how I'd describe Halo 2. Most of it anyway. When talking about Halo 2, I'm doing it in the mindset that I've just played Halo 1. So that's the baseline, the plateau I'm going to judge the quality of the sequel from. And my judgement is... Halo 2 shits on Halo 1. Purely in terms of enjoyment, the beat for beat and steady climb to the ending, Halo 2 is a ton more enjoyable to me than CE. It's not all sunshine and rainbows though. Halo 2 does suffer from the same skid of fun that CE had halfway through its runtime. Halo 2 just takes a bit longer to get there. The symptoms begin to show themselves around the second time you're thrust into the Arbiter. This mission, for whatever reason, feels like it goes on for years. Doesn't help too much that there's both a protracted vehicle section and a more drawn out and worse version of the elevator sequence we got in the heretic levels. This is one of the first times you fight the flood, on a small elevator, without much room to maneuver, with allies that help out a little bit, and the elevator itself moves quite fucking slow. That's made worse in this level, whatever the fuck the level's called. This little platform? Fuck it, don't want it, not good. Fighting the flood has never been an enjoyable experience, let's be honest with ourselves. An enemy that beelines towards you with flailing arms and the occasional ranged weapon that isn't a rocket launcher isn't the most challenging enemy on a small platform where you're constantly being topped up with stuff like shotgun ammo and energy swords. Keep in mind this bitching and moaning could just be me. This level could secretly be a masterpiece of game design and I'm just far too ignorant to understand that. Yeah, fucking right. It doesn't improve Halo's case when the next level as the Chief is easily the hardest in the game. Fuck this opening room. It's the same problem as the long empty corridor from CE, except this time I've got a piece of wet tissue paper as a substitute for shields. A person's enjoyment of a game is normally tied to how it feels to play. You can quantify said enjoyment by examining game design and scripted encounters. Or you can do what I'm about to do and say that all the levels after the second trip with the Arbiter 
all feel like they take far longer to complete than the opening levels of the campaign. It can't be that long in actuality because the final three levels only took me about 50 minutes by themselves, which isn't that long at all for three levels worth of content. But I can tell you, it didn't feel like 50 minutes. It felt like a few hours. Another problem I'm going to pull out of my ass right now and throw a bit of gas onto the fire for the hate comments I have no doubt are brewing right now. The boss fights. They're shit. The best of the bunch is the profit of regret. Getting close to an enemy that has enough firepower to melt you in a few seconds while trying to dodge a bunch of elites rushing you with energy swords, supported by needler and plasma pistol grunts, it's decent. Not perfect, because beating the boss is as simple as clearing a short path to him then punching him three times over and you're done. That's the best boss fight in the game though. The heretic boss, aside from being so fucking stupid as to deny himself an incredibly powerful ally who could openly sow dissent and lead his rebel forces, doesn't really have anything to make him overly special aside from two hologram lookalikes. We've faced jump pack enemies before this point, so he doesn't even have that going for him and the holograms are easier to kill than the big man himself. Not a great boss fight. Then there's Tartarus, who's about as stupid as the heretic leader. Despite being told directly from 343 Guilty Spark that the great journey is built on a lie, he decides to be prideful and ignore the holy oracle itself, setting in stone the fate of his entire race and every other fleshy body in the galaxy on his pride. Oh, and this is what the boss fight legitimately looks like. Mate, you're doing the fight wrong. You're meant to fight him on the platform. Someone will probably say in a silly fit of rage. Here's my question for you. If that's how I'm meant to fight the final boss of this game, why is cheesing him like this even an option for me then. Let's all remember that Halo 2 is operating on the offcuts of Halo Combat Evolved and one hell of a short development cycle. And if it only shipped with the campaign as the final product, we mightn't have gotten a Halo 3. Halo 2, in my opinion, made its bank off the multiplayer because everything that was bought to the groundbreaking table in Combat Evolved was improved upon and expanded even further in Halo 2. Even when the multiplayer and game itself are a little bit broken in parts, and some of the multiplayer maps haven't aged as gracefully as others. Even when the high-end competitive multiplayer scene liked using specific game rules to level out the playing field as flat as they could get it, the multiplayer saved Halo 2 from being just another pretty alright single player shooter. Am I wrong? Maybe. I have no doubt someone thinks I am. Doesn't change the fact that the ending itself, the climax, the send off, was cut short because they couldn't properly finish the story. So they chose the second best option, a cliffhanger. Master Chief, do you mind telling me what you're doing on that ship? Sir, finishing this fight. Won't lie, good line to send the game off with. You've taken down the clearest antagonist in the game and been introduced to a much bigger threat in the grave mind. Chief is on his way out of the danger zone, speeding to save Earth from the Covenant fleet en route, while leaving his closest companion behind in hopes she can manage to detonate the Inaba clad and make a big ol' explosion. Could the ending have been better? Yes. Is the ending we got bad? I don't think so. Would the proposed ending that Bungie had in mind have been an end over end improvement from the final product we actually got? I don't know. Haven't played it, but I'm going to say probably. But hey, let's 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 just run it back one more time. Master Chief, do you mind telling me what you're doing on that ship? Sir, finishing this fight. The chapter title says it all. I think Halo 2 was a better game to play and have fun with than CE was even at its best moments. On its lowest points, I would still take 2 over Combat Evolved. It's not a perfect shooter, but it's undeniably fun to play. And that's why we play video games, to have fun. It's also solidified Halo as THE Xbox FPS of choice the face of the brand and the console, the standard for every other first person shooter to try and meet. And it's not until another three years down the road from when Halo 2 came out that it finally got deposed of that title. 
For the meantime, however, the gameplay loop of Combat Evolved was improved and expanded upon. Better AI for friends and foes, newer weapon for both factions you play behind, an entirely new character to enact your slaughter with, even a select number of vehicles for you to further crush your foes beneath. There's bits that aren't great. The nerfs to the magnum and the shields are felt throughout the game and act against the overall experience. Let's not even talk about how lacking the boss fights actually are, or how much more difficult the game ends up being on Legendary because you can be one-shot rather reliably by normally weak enemies. The soundtrack, like the gameplay, improves on the template left behind by CE. From weapon sounds to character dialogue and AI barks to the soundtrack itself, the fucking soundtrack though. Yeah, end over end improvements to my mind. Some of which are improved upon yet again with the remaster. Like the sniper rifle. Fuck me, it sounds so good. The story, the narrative, the beat for beat journey, the overarching experience of Halo 2 is pretty all right. The cutscenes are way better than anything we got in Combat Evolved by a very long margin, and the small addition of seeing certain characters in cutscenes to later see them in gameplay and have your brain think, hey, that's the dude from the cutscene, is a nice thing to have happen. The narrative chapter markers of the boss fights are barely even a fight, and at their pinnacle, are mildly enjoyable in a sort of funny way. Like the super soldier is punching the hover chair bound prophet. I chuckle every time. I don't like the ending, but at the same time enjoy the finality and hype building potential of it all. How do you capitalize on that hype though? Can you capture the excitement you've just set yourself up for? Or do you fall ever so slightly short of true greatness? I guess we'll have to find out when we finish the fight. September 25th, 2007. A date somewhat forgotten by your boy. I was... 11, fearing that phase of life known as high school, where the drama happens and everyone gets put into a social class against their will. I didn't know it yet, but I was getting an Xbox 360 for Christmas that year. One of the big lads, the bleeding edge of technology, a whopping 20 gigabitties of storage for my games. I was lucky enough to have the box itself bundled with a few games. One was Call of Duty Modern Warfare, the other, well, what game do you think it was? You'll make a girl a promise, if you know you can't keep it. She'd stay behind. You might be too late. You'll know me when I make a promise. You keep You do know me, Rebecca. Lucky me. Here we are, yet again, at the preamble, talking about the rough background of the next Halo in question, and I have sad news. There's not too much for me to actually report that concerns the direct development of Halo 3. No, seriously, it was much smoother than the other games apparently. There was less drama going on inside Bungie than there was going on in the community that was chomping at the bit for a follow-up to, in the eyes of some, a bullshit cliffhanger, as well as an effort of one-upsmanship with the genre-defining multiplayer. The fans of Halo 1 and 2 were expecting the world, a decent end to a pretty alright story, and an improvement and honing of one of the best console multiplayer structures to have ever been put to circuits and servers. Bungie had a good idea of what they were getting themselves in for, and they attacked the task at hand reasonably well. I can't find any evidence that this development cycle was anywhere near as hellish as the previous cycles, because it wasn't Bungie that was causing the hullabaloo, it was Microsoft. Being the corporation that they are, old Micro of House Soft wanted to expand the Halo property into different genres and iterations, some think they are still struggling to do even in the modern day. There were plans for a movie, that got scrapped. There were plans for a David Cage-esque game, that got scrapped. About the only plan that Microsoft had in mind and actually followed through on was an RTS spin-off in the form of Halo Wars. And if you wanted my opinion on that one, well, it's a 
console RTS. It's nothing spectacular and probably would have flowed a bit better on the PC market. But as far as a game goes, for the sake of a game, I'd probably play it again while drunk. Forgetting the spin-offs for a moment, what about the main man itself? What about Halo 3? Well, if you wanted to know exactly how well Halo 3 did, it came out in the same year as Bioshock, Call of Duty 4, Mass Effect, The Orange Box, and Uncharted, just to name a few. And it still swept all sales records up to that point. That, that, that's a really good lineup of games. Like, fuck me fam, those are some really good games. But the hype, the excitement, the need to buy and play in spite of work or school or whatever commitment people might have had on the day of September 25th. That was the difference between Halo 3, the climax to a best-selling series, the flagship of an entire console and brand, and every other contender on the market. Hype is something that is hard to illustrate and quantify. I can't chart it in a graph. Showing you a clip of an audience reaction doesn't do much when the show's audio system is rat fucked. The only real way I can put it to you is that for some people, held in them the same passion people might cling to in modern games like Elden Ring or The Last of Us or Apex and pin it down as their entire personality trait. Halo 3 was some people's versions of Half-Life 3. It was their Final Fantasy 7 remake. It was, for a select group across the entire world, the most anticipated game in their life. And for those people, they probably had a grand old time. Too bad I think the campaign is just good. I said what I said. Let's make something clear. I don't outright hate Halo 3 as a single player experience. I think the changes coming over from Halo 2, being a little bit tankier in regards to shields, the few weapons additions, and the changes to the already beloved guns, are okay. I just think that Halo 2 was a bit more fun to play than what Halo 3 is on a moment to moment level. Halo 3 has better set pieces and individual moments to it, but Halo 2 is more enjoyable. This probably isn't sounding like a great argument, and that's cool because Halo 3 overall feels like a shoulder shrug to me. Very meh, all things considered. However, I'll take the combat of Halo 3 over Halo 2 any day of the week. Being able to actually take a few hits and carry on rather than melting the second your enemy sights you up. There are sparing changes to the older weapons that are something I'm on side with, like making the Brute Shot a straight line weapon rather than a bouncing suicide waiting to happen. The lower ammo count for the AR is something I was hesitant to accept, but bursting down a Brute and meleeing them for a solid kill in a spread radius that's much tighter than the original gun is something I warmed up to. The shotgun having a much shallower ammo pull to it on the trade-off for a bit more meat behind his shot is something I learned to get along with as well. The Magnum is still pretty shit though. It's never going to be as good as the OG from Combat Evolved. I'm gonna make that statement right now. There are also the new additions that make me like the combat of Halo 3 a bit more than its older brothers. The Spiker is certainly an addition alongside the AR and Pulse Rifle. Even though I think its damage could stand to be a little bit higher, I do like the reload animation, no lie. Best addition, as far as the on-ground combat goes, is the ability to jump on these very powerful turrets you see all over the place in Halo 2, and straight rip them off their housing and take them for a walk with you, which is something I very much expect from a 7 foot tall man-machine hybrid. Why yes, I can understand why a human would want this here, I however will take it with me. And here I was, ready to use that line as a quick segue to move on with this section, without mentioning the equipment pickups sprinkled throughout each of the combat sections. These select little goodies come in the form of the semi-iconic bubble shield, if only from that one quite good trailer. There's also the deployable cover, which is effectively the bubble shield except not a 360 arc. The flare, which is useful to momentarily blind yourself more so than the enemy. The Regenerator, which I never actually used, and also the fucking shield draining bastard. As well as a landmine and a little defense turret. Considering I damn near forgot to mention these little pickups, that should tell you how useful they were to yours truly. And to be completely honest, I can recall one occasion where I used a deployable cover to block a stairway to some brutes because I needed my shields to recharge. I would say that the Covenant themselves are better at using the equipment, but half of the time they seem to randomly throw it out with too much tactical sense. Then again, I am talking about a race of literal space monkey looking motherfuckers. 
Anyway, I find myself going back again and again to the first half of all these games because they're the part I have the most fun with, honestly. The opening level is a nice change, rather than a human-ish spaceship with grey corridors and copy-pasted hallways and rooms. You're given a lush jungle to run through and slaughter the lesser forms of alien in. I still fucking hate the jackals. Even once you do go back to the grey interiors, the game does enough to make it stand out in my memory amongst the various levels awaiting for the rest of the experience. Even when the better part of the game is spent on Earth itself, in various locations and stretches of what is meant to be a sun-kissed section of Africa, there's still enough open spaces in between the dull grey boring bits of level design that I can still have a bit of fun looking at the environment. Which isn't something I was doing much of, considering, once again, I was playing on Heroic. And while it's definitely easier than Halo 2, and didn't have any mildly bullshit bits like long empty hallways or that fucking council chamber, it wasn't the breeziest thing I've ever endured. Still fitting in that nice spot of difficult, but yet just easy enough that I could smash my way through the harder moments, and get that brief gamer rush of serotonin, like when you take down that scarab with mongooses. That was pretty fucking cool. The very not cool thing that I subtract SUBSTANTIAL points for are the constant fucking interruptions from Cortana. Yes, I'm aware that Big Lad Master Chief has a thing for the Blue Lady, and it's a reasonable thought that the gamer gaming their way on the gaming trials of Halo probably has a soft spot for her as well. But when you think it's a good idea to have her pop up several times per mission and slow the player to a literal crawl, even the mission where you're trying to save her, I think you might have fucked up in the planning phase. There's also the overwhelming feeling, to me, that Halo 3 doesn't have the same excitement that Halo 2 was packing for its whole runtime. It doesn't really feel like the climax of a trilogy, barring a few particular moments in cutscenes that I'll get to. The levels themselves don't feel like they build towards anything that grand, they more feel like you're going through the motions. There's a plotline the gameplay is following. There's a reason the levels are happening, but it just feels like meandering. Yes, I understand the unsteady alliance between the UNSC and the elites as there's a flood outbreak on Earth, and the common need to stop the Prophet of Truth from firing the Ark. But I felt more excitement when Sergeant Johnson was dropping me off a tank to go kill a big scary walker. Here's a statement of the century for you. Playing the campaign of Halo 3 is fun enough. The combat is something I definitely enjoyed and will probably go back to in future, but it also feels like it didn't even get close to the hype it had built itself up for over the course of two games and a full round of marketing. It could have been the ultimate cap off for a very good, iconic, much beloved series, and it ended up just being alright. And that's not helped at all by the narrative. I'll say the same thing I've been saying for a while, there's good moments in Halo 3, just not enough in quality or quantity to carry an 8 hour game on. I enjoyed taking down the Scarab, as I said earlier. I enjoyed clearing the hangar of the jetpack brutes and sending them flying against their dying will. I enjoyed fucking up packs of the Flood with a flamethrower. I enjoyed taking on two Scarabs in a Hornet without being in any real danger. But the part I enjoyed the most, as far as singular moments go, was THE moment the Ford Unto Dawn came streaming in, almost as a callback to the Pillar of Autumn streaming over the top of you in Combat Evolved, and then dropping off a few tanks for you to play with in a way too short vehicle section. But that moment, when that ship comes in out of the sky and pulls up, yeah, you, that, that was pretty cool. It's the bits surrounding all of those moments that I don't really vibe with that much. Firstly, I do think it was a bad idea to remove playing as the Arbiter at any point in the campaign. We could have gotten an entirely different angle on that whole uneasy alliance between the UNSC and the Elites. We could have taken a deeper dive into the Arbiter's newfound thoughts and views, considering the one truth he's known for almost his entire former life as a warrior of the Covenant have been exposed as a lie, having to unlearn his built-in hate for humanity as a lesser being. But nah, he's just a background character now, he's just kind of there for some missions, offering up a little bit of real-time dialogue that you can absolutely miss in the middle of a mission. Bit of a waste on that front in my mind. 
at least you would have had the chance to kill the Prophet of Truth yourself, rather than watching him die in cutscene. Because of the three original Covenant big lads, you've gotten to physically beat one of them to death. Secondly, while we're here on the Prophet of Truth, the change in the voice actor. Why? Who told you this was a smart idea? No disrespect to the work Terence Stamp puts in. He's definitely got a way of speaking about him that suits a villainous character, just not this one. The OG voice, Michael Wincott, delivers such a more distinct and quietly powerful version of the Prophet of Truth. He actually feels a bit more threatening when he speaks. A quiet confidence, if you will, rather than simply projecting power. Halo's destruction was your era. And you rightly bear the blame. But the council was overzealous. We know you are no heretic. This is the true face of heresy. One who would subvert our faith and incite rebellion against the High Council. Our poor world will burn until its surface is but glass. And not even your demon will live to creep, blackened from its hole to mar the reflection of our passage. The culmination of our journey, for your destruction is the will of the gods, and I, I am their instrument. Do you see what I mean? Like, I know my bitching and moaning is a bit late now, but hey, your boy, the game critiquer, will do that to you now and then. Thirdly, why does everyone gotta die? Like, Miranda Keys is the daughter to the apparent Chad from Combat Evolved and, by assumption, a capable military leader. So when she barrels a pelican into a known enemy position, presumptively aware of the fact that she's about to see more than a few enemies, probably the best of the best considering that there's a prophet present, she decides to fling herself into the hornet's nest without help and little more than a shotgun and pistol at her side just to rescue Johnson. Seems a bit fucking stupid to me, honestly. What's stopping her from picking up a squad of marines before she heads on in to fuck around and find out? Doesn't she have a direct communication line to the chief, who's literally an elevator away from the exact room in question? Why did she bring two of the worst weapons in the game to this fight? Like for fuck's sake, if you had the choice, why aren't you bringing along the BR? Predictably, Keys gets fucking murked in this scene, by the prophet of all people. Physically threatening, this man is not and he even used a spiker. Like, that's just disrespectful. Didn't even use the chair-mounted laser beams that we've been shown the prophets to wield. Because Key's got five-eighths of fuck all build-up and character development, this death feels completely hollow and meaningless. A death for the sake of a death to artificially raise tension. It's never a good move for a game or story to make. And the worst part of this nitpick is... They double down on it with Johnson. Why is Johnson, the dude with the much bigger gun, the one handling the index? Let Chief do it. You can still have the silly little blast from Guilty Spark and the absolute non-boss fight that follows it. Don't get me wrong, it's still satisfying to nuke that little fucking light bulb prick, but taking out Johnson right before it didn't add a whole lot to the narrative at this stage or the fight to begin with. Imagine instead, if Johnson didn't die right here, the Spartan one, Sergeant Major badass that these games have portrayed and try to push him as, and then have him show up in later games. He's as much of a mascot for the Halo franchise as Master Chief himself, but because the climax of the closing chapter of a big money making trilogy needed a little bit more payoff, Johnson gets fucking iced and has a split second tender moment with the Chief. Again, hollow is the word that comes to mind when talking about Johnson's death. In my head, that magical place where distractions happen. Having Johnson come back in one of the future games and helping out in the middle of combat just to have a bro moment in a cutscene would have been pretty dope. Then you could have weaved in a plotline about how old Johnson and the Chief actually are. Maybe have a cheeky line from Johnson like, Not all of us have the same stubborn bones you do, old man. I miss Johnson in Halo, but that's more out of spite than it is out of sadness. To me, Halo 3 as a narrative falters behind Halo 2, but I still enjoyed it more than Combat Evolved. That might sound extremely weird, but that's how I've stacked the series so far in my head. Like most stories I experience these days, Halo 3 has got the good bits and the bad bits. The bad bits, I just told you about. But the good little moments in the story, 
Having the Flood as an ally for that one mission, meeting back up with Cortana and having a little callback to the original game. But that sort of thing is something that I think Halo 3 kind of rides its story on. Fan service and callbacks. The final level, the Warthog Run, is in the shape of the Silent Cartographer map. There's more than a few vocal callbacks from previous games, like I mentioned earlier. Were it so easy? Just keep your head down. There's two of us in here now, remember? I'm positive there's even more basic details hidden in the fine print that series of veterans will call me out on, as well as probably just generally hate me for my opinion. But I'll stand by the statement that people remember Halo 3 because it's not only a nostalgia kick, but it's got a bunch of little details that harken back to the older games. If you want to know I'm right, look through a few other Halo videos and count the amount of people lamenting the death of the original online servers. How many people will be recalling old memories from this game, single player, co-op or multiplayer? There's a legion of people who hold this game in a special place in their heart. Sorry to say I'm not one of them, but I do think the soundtrack is still completely on point though. There's not too much to report on in regards to the overall sound design that I could distinctly pick out and criticize for you honestly. All the weapons sound nice enough, even the new spiker. There's a subtle change to the sonic report of the pulse carbine, but not a big enough change for me to point it out. And I've already gone over the one change to the voice acting that didn't really sit right with me. I say one change because the voice actor for Miranda Keys also changed between games, but I don't think it impacted the overall experience as much as changing the profit of truth. With all that in mind, I'm going to move swiftly onto the soundtrack itself. You know the score, Marty and Michael, back to deliver the goods once more. And the goods is the straight goody good stuff. Best in the series up until this point? Not quite. But it's definitely getting pretty fucking close. Other intros in the series' compositions definitely have a memorable quality with their swelling vocals carrying the body of the song and interplaying with the cutscene they follow along with. But the opening of Halo 3's composition is leading in class when it comes to a showcase of brass instrument structure, strings, accompaniment, and timing with a cutscene to make it all work. Special note to that small bit of soft strings when Chief thinks about Cortana. I've said a few times when talking about Halo comps that they're largely iconic and I'm not about to heel turn on that statement, but I think that the soundtrack note to note is a case study on why a good soundtrack is a must for a decent game to ascend into that great category. Could you imagine half the scenes from Halo with any other soundtrack, whether it's one that's been slightly miskeyed or has ill-fitting instruments for a particular moment in the action or lack thereof? There's something that happens in good games that have great composers backing them up. It's called a musical motif. It can be a chord arrangement or a particular instrument having its own solo piece that you'll recognize later. Planting that motif earlier in the game and bringing it back later is something Martin O'Donnell is quite good at. Of course, you don't have to take my word for it, unless you do. But I'm going to play two completely different tracks right now and I can pretty certainly bet that you can pick the musical motif between them, and the veterans in the crowd are going to have a hard flashback on the second track. This one creeps in with the motif that was started at the opening of the game with the rolling drums and singing strings. 
then immediately replaces it with a new motif, that ever recognizable piano chord, before fully opening up the floodgates to the horns and the strings to take center stage as the drums provide that ever important and solid backup. But seeing as I'm talking about motifs, I'm going to play the next track and just let it run a bit longer than usual. If you don't listen to it, cool. But I want the people who have stuck through this series so far, especially the motherfuckers who are fans of the franchise and have been atting me for reviews like this for a while. Just listen carefully. This track, motif in audio form, that piano note I literally just showed you, the same rolling drums and deeper piano that gave me a flashback to truth and reconciliation from Combat Evolved. Given that this is the song for the final Warthog run, you should expect that sort of thing. This song, this one right here, is emblematic of the journey Halo has gone on, from Combat Evolved through to and now to here the last moments of the climax to the foundational trilogy that launched Xbox into the gaming market and gave Microsoft another money drain. It's the ending to Master Chief's journey under Bungie, and both Marty and Mikey said, fuck it, we'll hit him in the nostalgia. It's a fucking good song. I'm not even going to try and tell you otherwise. On a sonic listening in isolation level, as an in the moment piece for the final Warthog run, and as an analyzed waveform. It fits so snugly inside of Halo as a series that if I had to pick one, just one track to represent this Bungie trilogy, this is the one, the sole example I'd use to hook someone into playing these three games. It, in my mind, is that fucking good. If you were to ask me, which I know you didn't, Halo 3 could have been better. But there's a line I'm going to borrow from the opening that I think fits Halo just a little bit too well. But you had something they didn't. Something no one saw but me. Can you guess? Luck. I don't use that line to belittle or discredit the devs who poured their blood, sweat and tears into this trilogy. This is their baby. The marketing budget provided from Microsoft definitely helped with boosting Halo's presence, and not every shooter franchise could have launched a brand and solidified console multiplayer. Just ask PlayStation how well their several attempts at a Halo killer have gone. But this is Halo. Specifically, this trilogy that a lot of people love dearly. This franchise that started right in my childhood that I also have fond memories of. Let me sling it this way. If Halo came out today, fresh, no previous versions, would it still be considered great? Would we have gotten a trilogy out of it? Or would it just be another spacey shooter mans with regen shields in the place of regen health? Think for a moment on the amount of cut and repurposed content between games. If you tried to do that in the modern day, you wouldn't even release a game. You either have everything planned out from the get-go, have one free revision, or spend double the original dev time in development hell. Considering that, I don't think Halo could have come out even five years later than it originally did. It got lucky at the precise moment it came out, to have the feature set it did for the multiplayer, and the limitations it brought to the FPS formula. 
I can't deny that nostalgia is a big part of why I enjoyed playing these three games, as much as you might think otherwise from the words coming out of my mouth. Trying to look past my own nostalgia and potentially be a bit too harsh. The Halo trilogy, the big lad for Microsoft, the through line and catalyst for a lot of the preceding decade of console shooters is just kind of alright. There's good moments, as I've said a few times, but in the critical mindset I've put myself into, there's not much here to fawn over. The best part of Halo, and the one that carries a hefty amount of weight, is the soundtrack. It is my favourite part so far. The action is enhanced in a way that's hard to quantify with words when it's backed by such a remarkably solid composition. There's more than a few tracks in these videos that I call iconic, because the moment you hear them, you know the franchise they're tied to, and the setting when you first heard them. The multiplayer was the workhorse that carried Halo sales entry to entry in my mind. The single player just being an alright audition to that main feast that people poured hours into both back in the day and with the release of the Master Chief Collection. Of course, what I say isn't going to stop you from enjoying Halo. You already know if you like it. That's probably why you're here, to see if I share your opinions and sentiments. And I'm sorry if we don't see completely eye to eye on these games. Too bad for us both, however, that we've only just begun. And I have no plans to stop just yet. Take your seats, hell jumpers. Some people will hate me for this, but a stopgap is exactly what ODST was developed to be. To fill in a slot in Microsoft's release schedule while they try to figure out what they're going to do once Bungie leaves and they've got a monolithic IP to still look after. But in the meantime, Bungie is still in the books, so they were put to work on Halo Recon, which naturally evolved into Halo ODST. One piece of this puzzle is the cancelled David Cage-esque formerly known as Halo Chronicles, the one with Peter Jackson on the paperwork, meant to be a sort of episodic experience, focusing in on the Marines of the Halo universe more so than the Spartans. And it even featured murmurings of the fucking Prometheans. This project was eventually scrapped because of money reasons, and the team that had been working on Chronicles was folded into the development for ODST. So if you're wondering why a main plot point of the game is picking up random bits and pieces just to put it back down again, I think the repurposed Corpse of Chronicles is where that's coming from. I could say that the development of ODST was neither easy nor difficult. They had a lot of assets and code left over from Halo 3 to use in its construction, but the devs needed to trim down and tweak other bits that were purposed for a completely different project. There's a few problems that carry over from this dev cycle, like the story itself, once analysed, being very unimpressive, and multiple elements of the gameplay being a little bit silly considering the protagonist you're meant to inhabit. Probably the biggest part that Bungie changed between games was the multiplayer, as in they completely got rid of it. Well, completely in the sense of the traditional multiplayer everyone would have been used to. The team slayers, the capture the flags, the other modes? No. Instead, ODST has Firefight, which I'm lacking footage for because I don't trust strangers to pull their weight. Firefight is basically a Halo branded horde mode. You and friendos hold out against wave after wave of enemies for points and gamer clout. All praise the gamer clout! It's a good mode to kill a few hours with the fam, especially when you've been drinking, but as far as horde modes go, you could do a bit better. So we've stripped out the multiplayer, and there's plenty of copy paste from Halo 3 going on. So why did Microsoft think this game was worth $60? Because it is roughly the same length as another extremely popular shooter released at the time. Now, I'll openly say I don't think ODST should have been worth 60 bucks on release, because it barely feels like a complete game, especially one that's meant to be showing a different perspective within the Halo universe. 30 bucks would have sat a bit more okay with me. 
Then again, this is also the era where Microsoft started to lose ground in the all-important console wars, because not too long after ODST hit shelves, Xbox began pushing the Xbox Connect down everyone's throat to try and squeeze in on the family market that Nintendo had thoroughly cornered. Some, myself included, would cite this as the start of the slow decline for the once great Xbox and Microsoft game studio brands, culminating in the outright disastrous release of the Xbox One, a launch that was so bad they're still trying to recover from it. Basically, I think the only reason ODST was ever shipped for 60 bucks is because Microsoft got greedy and had their head a bit too far up their own ass. There's a bit more than one reason as to why I think ODST is still worth at least a little bit of money to the average gamer. Mainly, that soundtrack though. Cause... ho. Halo music is good, this is an established fact, but I think that ODST might be the best of the bunch. It could be because deference to darkness is just different to everything else in the series so far. No George in choirs, not quite as many orchestral sweeps to lift the tension, a lot more piano and strings than before, even the underlying and often unused saxophone like you just heard. You know it's still Halo but it's separate from the other games in such a way that it stands on its own. Sure, Maddie and Michael do return to form with the daytime tracks for the other half of the game, but when you're the rookie, roaming the streets and surviving against the Covenant, oh man, it's just good stuff. Pianos and strings is something I've always seen as a bit of a hack for an emotional cue in compositions, but knowing that the dev team had a turn towards neo-noir film trappings in their development makes that type of instrumentation fitting for an experience that's largely following a lone soldier walking through rain-covered streets at night. Like, listen to some of these softer tracks and tell me you can't imagine a man in a trench coat smoking a pipe on a black and white screen and saying some shit like, "New no Mombasa. A city filled with young dreamers and old timers, covering up a veneer of corruption and debauchery, barely recognizable under the plasma fire and streaking rain. Do you think you can last here? Well, do you, rookie? I always struggle talking about music in games, not just because I'm horrible at writing and reading out these scripts, but because putting into words the feeling a song can carry with how the instruments are laid and used to back one another up, on top of the gameplay moments where you'll hear that track for the first time. It's a talent your boy does not possess. But I don't need such a talent to talk about the part of ODST that everyone who's ever played it tends to agree on. The atmosphere do be lip-smackingly on point. Remember when I said talking about music and the feelings they bring on is hard? Yeah, apply that to this whole section. If I sound like I'm rambling, I'm just trying to get words out in a way that kinda makes sense. To support the point that New Mombasa is atmospheric as fuck, do a quick YouTube search and count how many compilations you find that are just the piano-focused bits of the soundtrack with a bit of ambient rain on top. It's moody. I like it. This whole feeling was probably helped by my playing the game on Heroic, as usual, but the breaks between combat encounters when everything quietens down again, and it's just the rain, your footsteps, and maybe a fleeting bit of music. Yeah, that hits my vibe spot quite nicely. Little bit of rain, little bit of cozy, little bit of violence. It's good. 
The game doesn't open with those chill vibes however, it opens with a drop pod insertion. Yeah, there's also Nathan Fillion, but drop pods. The Virgin Dropship Trooper versus the Chad, nah, fuck it. I'll descend through the atmosphere at a heat that could vaporize the flesh from my bones and hit the ground with enough force to give a lesser being a concussion. But I am an orbital drop shock trooper, and we descend feet first into hell. Yeah, I like drop pods as a concept. This is a cool little opening. But when you touch down in the city and blow the safety bolts off your orbital coffin, you're given a rain-soaked and very, very quiet environment compared to every other Halo, and most other shooters for that matter. Like I said, there's a reason almost every review for ODST mentions the atmosphere, because it bleeds with every step you take in the city, while you're on your own anyway. Another thing to mention as you walk around the city, you can find these com logs that cover the journey of a side character that's linked to the superintendent AI helping you throughout the narrative, but she never appears in the gameplay as far as I noticed anyway. They're a nice little addition to the game that doesn't necessarily distract from the point to point walking and shooting, but adds a little bit of flavor to enhance the walking itself. Plus it helps that they can unlock the superintendent caches, which are fucking useful when you're low on ammo. Walking isn't what you really do in the daytime levels though, because you're playing from the rather chatty perspective of other ODSTs in this little squad. The daytime levels are much more action oriented, following in the style that you're in an active combat zone when you're running through those missions. The way ODST likes to link the solo walking around the city bits with the full tilt combat explosive bits with the rest of the squad is by throwing the rookie into the city and saying, hey, find this thing. Then once you find it, he picks it up, you have a flashback, and he puts it back down. Not the greatest point of the game to be sure. I know it's a point that's been brought up in other reviews that the non-linear structure of the missions themselves brings up the potential to play missions in the wrong order, but you'd really, really have to be trying to play these out of order honestly, because the open world is so restrictive and bottled in that you can normally only go to one flashback at a time. The only spot where I can see the chain of missions being broken is towards the end when you've almost finished the story anyway and can be reasonably expected to fill in the gaps yourself. Don't worry gamer, I know you've got a brain somewhere in that head. God knows what heretical shit it's filled with. I'll keep repeating myself that I like playing as the rookie more so than the other members of the ODSTs. One reason is because of his setting and the whole blank canvas for the player angle that mute protagonists have to them. The other reason is that I don't like anyone else. There's a trait from Joss Whedon's school of writing that I kind of hate. Characters need to constantly talk out loud or make quips for the sake of being relatable slash likable. I've dubbed the modern form of this disease as Disneyitis, because holy shit there's a lot of it going on in Star Wars and Marvel. The extended cast of ODST is very much guilty of this, and it's done in a way that is neither unique nor well executed. Dutch is the hardened fighter that likes the big man up top. Romeo is the smart-ass sharpshooter. Mickey is the loudmouth, gung-ho demolitions expert. Then there's Buck. Buck is more likable than the rest because he actually fleshes out the story a bit more and doesn't crack wise in almost every cutscene he's a part of. But he isn't above making the odd joke in a way that doesn't add to what I assume is an intended feeling of adventure. Oh, there's also Dare, I guess. She's here too. There's a thing between her and Buck that's kind of the whole reason the game is happening to begin with, but Dare also happens to be part of Oni, which is a shadowy government organization if ever there fucking was one. They are definitely not the good guys as far as Halo goes, and Dare doesn't help out on that front with how combative and vague she is in multiple points of the story. If you wanted to know what I mean when I say that the cast is quippy, here's some of the examples that annoy me a bit more than others. Keep in mind that these are soldiers, meant to be in an active war zone, defending it from an enemy that wants to kill off their entire race. Ah, uh, Lord, I didn't train to be a pilot. Tell me I don't have any more flying to do today.
So, was that a yes or a no? Amen. Hey, rookie, you out there? The spawn, that's an order. Give it up, Gunny. Even if he ain't dead, he's lost in that soup. Our comms can't cut through that. Oh, give up, huh? What if it were you down there? Just saying. I ain't dead. <laughs> You're a piece of work, Romeo. Hey! Where's the fight at? Take a guess, genius. Where did it go? Covered. And try to keep up. Take my advice, rookie. You ever fall for a woman? Make sure she's got balls. There's one last little thing that I didn't quite like about ODST. It's that you're meant to be playing as different members of a squad of ODSTs, each that have different specializations and training, as well as just being bog standard humans maybe with a little bit better armor compared to the standard marine. Except they all play almost exactly the same as Master Chief. You can still rip turrets off their housing and carrying them around like you've got mechanically enhanced arms, and not just some buff noodles attached to your torso. You can still jump so high that you'd put NBA All-Star teams to shame. Despite wearing several pounds of armor, I'd be very willing to bet would make jumping a little bit more difficult. To the game's credit, they did slightly nerf the melee damage, but at the same time, all the enemies are still the same size they've always been. Remembering for a moment that the Master Chief is meant to be 7 foot 2 in his armor. Something tells me that the average ODST isn't meant to be close to even 6'6". Looking past those complaints, there's a bit of missed potential with making every trooper play the exact same. There's no squad commands you can use while playing as Buck. Mickey doesn't do extra damage with explosives. Romeo has no aiming advantage with one weapon over another. Dutch does start the game with a Spartan laser, and that's maybe the only thing that fits in with any character as far as their traits being shown through gameplay goes. But there's nothing separating any of the ODSTs in their individual gameplay, aside from different voices and unique armor color layouts. They can all jump, run, shoot, and kill just as well as the Chief can but they're not meant to be anything like the Chief. That's my biggest problem with the narrative and gameplay of ODST. You're meant to be a special forces soldier, sure, but you feel like a half-assed version of a literal, mechanical, and genetically augmented super soldier. Takes away from the experience when I don't feel any different from killing a grunt or a jackal, when those enemies are meant to be genuinely terrifying to the average human. Massive missed opportunity to make this game feel unique both in the scheme of the larger FPS genre and in the Halo franchise itself. Oh well, maybe that's all Bungie could manage considering they're trying to close the door on Microsoft. ODST is a carryover of the feeling I began to have in Halo 3. Bungie is done with this series. They want to move on to do something different where they can actually innovate a genre again. It's the burning out of a studio that, over time, is finding it harder and harder to reinvent the wheel in the same way they did with the first blockbuster in Halo Combat Evolved. The gameplay is a near direct copy of Halo 3, barring minor changes to try and sell the idea that you're playing as a highly trained Joe Blow rather than an armored clad Chad. But it's only halfway done. Whether it's the enemies not posing any more of a threat than usual, the finer details between characters being non-existent, and the overall feeling in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay making it seem like you're just a Spartan carrying an exceptionally large backpack, rather than a highly trained average Joe that should only be slightly less deadly in terms of combat prowess, jumping as high, carrying as much, and being on par with the Chief isn't what this game should feel like. But that might be me nitpicking. But hey, this is my video. I'll be the first one on the cap to say that Deference to Darkness is my favorite song from all of Halo. A very tall order, I know, considering that I haven't played the rest of this series yet. Truly, I am pulling the trigger a bit early, but I'm confident it won't be topped down the line.
The narrative of ODST is so nothing. It ties itself into Halo 3 and costs 60 bucks when it first came out. But the quips from the squad mates and the attempt at the laid back tone for what is meant to be a bunch of professionals in a war zone kind of fucking kills it. The Rookie's solo story isn't that interesting once you start thinking about it outside of the cozy atmosphere of a dying city in the rain, and it only really picks up and shows its full hand towards the end, without too much foreshadowing or alluding to. Aside from a few of the later audio logs, a singular cutscene with Buck and some mid-gameplay dialogue you could miss, or a two-trigger happy with and cut short. And the ending fucking sucks. Not only are you trying to retread the Warthog run that we've seen in previous games, you're adding an escort mission on top of it. And once that's finally done, hey, here's a wave-based horde mode to close out our game with. ODST has a good opening and semi-sandbox to hook you with. But if you don't like quippy dialogue and didn't like the gameplay loop from the older Halos, there's nothing you'll be missing out on in ODST. I said it at the start that Bungie was making two more Halo games. This makes one, but what about the second? Well, get ready to witness the fall. What's it like to fight knowing you're going to lose? baby. That overture still hits me good. One thing that hit Bungie pretty good was having a half decent amount of time to actually develop a game, as Reach, from what I can summarize and research, wasn't a crunch-filled hell march like nine-tenths of what the franchise has released so far. It was started right after Halo 3 was released, and had the full three years worth of dev time devoted to it, with the workers from ODST being thrown into the mix once that sideshow was done, dusted, and shipped. It might be for this reason that the classic multiplayer that Halo had built its bread and butter on returned to form with the rather noteworthy addition of Forge Mode. This mode, many an hour was spent in it back in the day, many a custom mode was spawned in its wake. It's almost like giving a passionate community the tools that allow them to create their own game modes and maps to fuck around in is an incredibly good idea. This multiplayer. For your homie is the one I fell into between custom games and the SWAT playlist. Yeah, I played this bitch until I hit legend rank. I essentially no life to reach for most of 2010, and I loved every single minute of it. Although some of the more hardcore fans didn't vibe with the changes coming over from Halo 3. This is the point I would like to bring up the ever elusive fourth key to combat for Halo, abilities. Bungie's always had a good handle on the first three keys, movement, weapons, and grenades. Now, I'm no Halo multiplayer expert, but that base template is how you make a good multiplayer. However, tying abilities into that mix could enhance the loop, or it could utterly break it. Guess which happened thanks to armor lock and evade. Go to ram someone with a vehicle? Better hope they don't have armor lock and EMP your ass just to hijack your vehicle and drive off. Ready for an energy sword and grab hammer jewel? Pray the opponent doesn't have a Vade equipped because they're going to fly right past you for an assassination in a heartbeat. I can commend the effort Bungie was going for with the abilities, but they did not succeed. Guns, movement, and map knowledge of sightlines and power weapons. These key points should have stayed the foundations of Halo's multiplayer. You can add the same amount of variety the abilities should have bought by adding in more interesting weapons. But if I'm going to ramble about the weapons, we might as well shift over to the gameplay part of this whole talking thing I've been carrying on with for a few months now.
coming right on through from interesting weapons, the grenade launcher. It's a bit atypical to your standard explosive belcher. If you hold the trigger down, the launcher will spout forth a standard grenade, as it normally would. But when you release the trigger, it detonates with an EMP blast that is very, very good at disabling any vehicle caught in its radius. At least for a few seconds anyway. That one weapon already changes the dynamic of a foot soldier going up against a vehicle, which is something the armor lock also did in multiplayer, but with the added effect of being an annoyance to go up against because the only real counter you have for that ability is a well-timed plasma grenade, if you've even got one to spare anyway. Another interesting weapon, to me anyway, is the needle rifle, falling in line with the DMR as a replacement for the BR. The needle rifle is an incredibly accurate precision weapon. The catch is that it's a needler-based weapon, meaning that if you land enough hits on target, you get a nice pink explosion. It felt to me that the weapon itself was a bit more accurate than the DMR, because it was actually harder to land headshots due to the lack of bullet magnetism. Then again, if the target doesn't have any sort of shields, they've got a max of three shots to be alive before they're, you know, not alive. There's also the laser designator for the few times you actually get some fire support in your shooty shoots with the Covenant, which does kill Wraith tanks really well when I get the opportunity to use the damn thing. There's a few other additions from the Covenant side of the fight, such as the Plasma Repeater, the Plasma Rifle for people trying to miss their targets and compensate for their lack of girth. The more annoying offsider to the Plasma Repeater is the Focus Rifle, a weapon I'm certain was conceived purely to annoy the fuck out of players when they're zoomed in, because it doesn't do an outstanding amount of damage, but even stubbing your toe on a rock is enough to kick you out of that pretty headshot you had lined up. Then there's a weapon I actually like, the Type 52 Plasma Launcher. He might be a bit slow to get going, but he kills pretty good when he gets there. While we're here on the weapons, it should be noted that all of the guns, once again, have gotten a overhaul in terms of their visuals. I think this iteration of the sniper rifle is probably my favorite of the series so far. The chunky latch release on the empty clip reload is what gets me. The DMR is a close second, partly because of my lovely SWAT memories, partly because of the precision weapon meta in the campaign itself. Helps the game overall that no weapon I immediately point to feels especially weak or useless. The Magnum in Halo 3 fired far too slowly to be useful, yet the pistol in Reach fixes this issue without stepping into the almost broken territory of the original CE hand cannon. The assault rifle is still effective in bursting down the shields of whichever enemy I'm facing, whether I finish them with a melee or a headshot. The shotgun is still nice and hefty, folding nicely into the ever-needed role of a close-range closet cleaner, providing a nice one-two with a follow-up skull bashing. The rocket launcher is a bit of a cheat code when I don't want to deal with the grav hammer brute running towards me. A shame the fuel rod cannon isn't on the same level, because even with a direct hit, that bitch can't kill nothing. Like I said earlier, the precision meta is alive and well in Halo Reach. Sniper rifles, DMRs, the needle rifle, the Magnum. These are the guns I stuck with throughout most of the campaign. There was room for pretty much every other gun, but that core group was my selection of all reliables. For those with their notepads out, Reach continued my trend of playing through Halo on Heroic, and it's still perfectly manageable. I'ma say Reach is probably one of the games I've died the most in so far, mainly due to this <laughs> one. Fucking cool assassination bit. The assassinations themselves are a cool thing that's been added when you backslap an enemy. Rather than said enemy just falling over, you can send them out with some style. Shoutouts to the multiplayer plebs who yoink the kill away from said assassination. Even the AI can do it sometimes. There's something I want to bring up that ties into the narrative section. The missions themselves make sense. As you roll along and fulfill objective after objective, there's a logical through line you follow in the defense of your second home, beyond the second mission anyway. Once you've dropped off the MacGuffin from the first mission to Halsey and established the defense of Sword Base, you go on a recon mission to see how many aliens you're actually dealing with. Once you figure that one out, you lead an assault to punch a hole in the defensive net which reveals the big bad supercarrier. So, using some pretty sweet space capable fighters, you mosey your way on up to another Covenant ship that's on a refuel run and give it a good old tap with a ball-peen hammer, courtesy of Big Boy George. 
falling back to the surface and you naturally making your way towards the nearest city as the Covenant Assault ramps up, helping with the evacuation before rejoining your team and effectively trying to buy time, while Command figures out what the fuck we're meant to do. Progressing into a demo op of the info-sensitive sword base, which links into the all-important escort mission to tie us into the beginning of Combat Evolve. There's a coherent line of thought between each point, the greater objectives and gameplay segments for each mission to fit into like a glove. Helping out with the evacuation in New Alexandria makes sense because you're already there in the moment so you might as well get to work. You being the pilot for the Sabre mission makes sense because, as stated in the cutscene just before it, you're the only one in the squad who's already had a bit of playtime behind the stick. And George is coming with you because he's the closest thing to a demo expert Noble Team has to offer. There isn't too much reaching going on with the mission structure and objectives inside of Reach, but that might be me cherry picking for good points in a way I didn't do for previous games. Or Halo Reach might actually be that good. Just like the soundtrack having one of my favourite little moments tied to gameplay so far. Marty and Michael, once more, making bangers like it ain't no big deal at all. Except this time my favourite track isn't even from a single piece. It's a sliver of a score that happens a whole lot of once in the game. No reoccurring motif, no callbacks to kick up my nostalgia. Just a one-time riff to sell the moment you meet the big baddies of the game, in a moment that, in and of itself, is done remarkably well in my mind. When this piece actually flows in, you're aware of it. It sells the almost horrific reveal of the Elites, the poster boys for the Covenant, being on reach. Even though you fought the Elites a few times in that level already, and I'll get to that criticism later, this track sells that these are some dangerous boys, and they shouldn't be fucked with unless you're competent. Also, the way the Marine is trying to claw his way back around the corner, and then you just see this great big mitt pull him back, yeah, Elites are fucking big dudes, and eventually you'll run out of ammo fighting them. The learned veterans of the Halo franchise already know that Reach doesn't end in an overall victory. You know from the outset that you're going to die, and the game blatantly shows you as much. But I don't think there's too many people at all who just sit back in that final fight and accept what's coming. I choose to believe that everyone tries to take as many of the enemy out with them as possible. Knowing the end at the beginning isn't something to drive you forward, but I won't lie for a moment that when I hear those opening drums, I'm fucking ready. Yes, I know I already showed a part of this song, but fuck you, good songs are good and I'ma show them as much as I fucking please. Just like how the overall construction of the Overture is just so fucking nice. An Overture, for those that haven't been to an opera before, is a musical piece normally composed of multiple shorter individual songs that reference specific moments from the entire experience, that are later all brought together at the end as one complete piece. To illustrate the point, the opening seconds of Overture have a smattering of the classic Georgian chanting that we all know from Halo as being the distinctly Halo thing from pretty much every opening we've had so far. Rolling on into the solo percussion that eventually is backed up by some nice rolling strings and deep piano to build a very, very nice body to the main segment of the Overture itself pushing on through the climax and reaching probably the most recognizable part of the overture, a singular track called Immemorial, My Boy George, I Miss Him. <laughs> 
The fact that all these bits are from one song should showcase to you what a nice overture is normally entailing, and the fact that this is the opener of the game makes my heart warm with satisfaction. Almost as satisfying as the numerous deaths you witness in your time on Reach. There's a part about the narrative of Reach that I do quite love, even outside of the Halo series and the broader shooter genre in general. Death is a method to raise the stakes of a given scenario, and a lot of games like making a character's death extremely exaggerated in terms of the drama behind it. Not to say that emotional deaths don't have a place in shooter games, there's certainly a spot for them, but all the deaths in Reach, aside from the extremely sudden one, all have a send off that, to me, makes sense when it's coming out of the mouths of super soldiers like the Spartans. Like, knowing that you're about to die and being ready to stare it in the face in the line of your duty for humanity and spouting out some shit. Oh boy, it's good stuff. Bad news is, time is fried. I'm gonna have to fire it manually. That's a one way trip. We all make it sooner or later. We can get past this, sir. No, you can't. Not without help. Commander, you don't have the firepower. I've got the map. Silent cop. Hit him hard, boss. You're on your own, Noble. Carter out. Who's next? I'm ready! How about you? Oh. Oh. Emil's line though. I'm ready! How about you? Yep, that crazy motherfucker is ready to meet God and take a few split lips with him. Now, I'll be the first to tell you that lore, for almost any game, doesn't interest me. And there's a lot of lore backing up Reach as a setting. How it's the second home for humanity, and it's THE most heavily defended planet even including Earth. Having all of the available Spartans stationed on planet thinking that it's the next target for the Covenant. They were right. A lot of people die on Reach. Spartan, Marines, ODSTs, General Navy staff, and more than a few UNSC carriers. Which should tell you how much of a back foot humanity is put on with this rather cataclysmic event in this timeline. But given that it ties directly into Halo 1, you likely already know how the overall story of this character, not named Master Chief, is going to turn out. So, as we inhabit the body of Noble Six, let me give you the rundown. You discover the Covenant on Reach, when you're supposed to be investigating a potential rebel attack on a communication station. The rest of the campaign, after that, is trying to stem the bleeding, and get as many people off-world as you can. Everyone in your team dies in the pursuit of that goal. Aside from June, even though we've never had anything super official come out about his survival. And when the game threw the Are You Invested test at me, I passed ever so slightly. These squaddies are likeable enough, even though they're lacking development towards the player character, and don't really showcase any sort of developed relationship between the members in-game, barring that one cutscene where Kat convinces Carter about her dirty bomb plan. I thought it made it pretty clear that these two have known each other for quite a while. It's all told through the lens of a more, dare I say, grounded version of Halo compared to the older games. The use of different camera angles mirroring those from real world war zones. The artificial camera noise, the off color grading, the straight up synthetic handheld shots as the game runs through. It feeds into the futile nature of the narrative and helps drive forward how much more of a boots on the ground experience Halo Reach is compared to the relative power fantasies from the rest of the series. You know how I mentioned the whole meeting death with a handshake thing? Knowing you're going to die somewhere along in this fight or something like that? It's really hammered home at multiple points in the story you just can't catch a fucking break. You discover the Covenant, which is a bad start. Then you need to fight them off the doorstep of the most important building on Reach. Then you need to recon what their forces are looking like and find an army casually just sitting there. When you go to try and punch a hole in their cloaking field to expose them for orbital fire and heaven forbid use MAC rounds in atmosphere, a supercarrier pops up and one shots the nearest most powerful ship you've seen so far. And even 
once you take that big sumbitch out, at the cost of one of your squad mates, the rest of the fucking fleet arrives. Just after you evacuate the biggest city on Reach, and you think you've earned a little bit of a sit down, the Covenants say, nah fam, did you know, at high enough temperature and pressure, that humans can be turned into glass? and then they fucking kill the only waifu the game has to boot. So you fuck off to the Oni base once more to make sure the data you're holding there isn't used against you. And you're given the quite important task for the sake of the series, just to end up losing your squad leader shortly after because he's just a straight up boss. Just to finally, finally deliver Cortana to Keys and have a momentary glimpse of success right before Emil heads on out and you go up to man the gun and watch your last hope of leaving the planet just fly away. Kicking the player while they're down is the sentence that comes to mind and I mean that in the best way. You're constantly on the back foot, reeling from the blows the Covenant are dishing out and just when you think you can swing back they throw another hefty punch right at you and you're back on the defensive. Even in the final level, your send off as Noble Six you're not running out there and slaughtering the enemies that drop in. You're just trying to last, because it's your defensive instincts firing off. Fight until you can't fight anymore. Then face death with a smile and a handshake. Halo Reach has its place in my heart as my favourite Halo game of the bunch. So far, anyway. We've got three more games to potentially knock it off its podium, but I think its position atop the mantle is rather secure. I like the new weapons Bungie threw into the gameplay loop, even if their unfortunate cousins in the armour abilities don't have the same positive impact in my mind. The soundtrack by Marty and Michael. What can I really say on it? These men composed the larger part of the Halo series. You know you're getting quality, and you know it's going to sound like Halo. It shouldn't be a shock to any fan of the series, or any enjoyer of good video game compositions, that Halo Reach, once more, has some banger notes carrying the story. Not that the story needed much carrying. Between the cinematography, the overall grittier and more grounded feeling the narrative has buckled to it, the team of spawns surrounding you, it's all a fine blend to make the story work for the eight or so hours you're going to spend down on Reach and the eternity your character will spend thereafter. It's a good game, a good Halo game, a perfectly fine prequel to that all-important first entry that kicked all of this off to begin with. Is it a worthy send-off and goodbye from Bungie? For me, it could have been better. Characters could have shared more interactions between one another and built up the connections between each member of Noble Team relative to the player character. I could have liked each member a bit more than I initially did, with a little bit more effort into fleshing them out. The opening of not dramatically revealing the Covenant just to have a cutscene that is meant to dramatically reveal the Covenant is a talking point that will never go away from this game. If the entire first level had been reversed, barring finding the distress beacon, it would have been a much better setup to introducing and letting you know that shit has hit the fan in this universe. I still like the game we got anyway, perfectly satisfying experience. That's it for Bungie however, they're done with Halo. They're palming off the franchise they created, built and maintained for a full decade. And now Microsoft has to find a team worthy and willing to try and fill those rather big shoes Bungie is leaving behind. So I guess we'll have to find out how these new guys went, won't we?
the fuck put the Prometheans in here? That's a rhetorical question. I know it was 343 Industries, the new kids on the block, picking up the reins and attempting to fill the shoes of the now legendary Bungie. From what I can tell, 343 mirrored Bungie so well on their first crack with the Halo IP that they too had a horribly inefficient development cycle. Whether it's with the original six enemies for the Prometheans being trimmed down to three just to run into several speed bumps because of the conflicts between art design and mechanical implementation, or the fact that 343 felt the need to take the narrative in a rather different direction than anything Bungie had even poked at with the Chief, switching him from a canvas the player could inhabit to an established being you merely play as, retooling this more expressive and emotional version of Master Chief into a narrative that wasn't even decided upon for the first few months of development. Turbulent is once again the word I want to use. Not that the situation was at all helped by Microsoft, who, despite being convinced that another studio, Certain Affinity, should have co-developed the multiplayer portion of Halo 4, decided that throwing more and more money at the problems presented would eventually make them go away and give them a good return on investment. If only they knew the fuck-ups that would take place. I'm getting all the stuff I hate out of the way first so that the good stuff can come later. Firstly, Promethean Knights, the poor man's elite that are a fair bit tankier and less enjoyable to fight. I despise the shotgun variants, and every time one of these bitches drops their shields, they just teleport away and abuse the iframes to prolong their lives by just enough that it becomes an annoyance. Two of the main guns that are introduced with the Prometheans are next to fucking useless. The bolt gun and suppressor. Trash. Do not like. Factually fucking shit. I'd take the assault rifle over the suppressor any fucking day of the week, provided I've actually got ammo for it. I'd take a spoiled pile of shit over using the fucking suppressor, because at least the pile of shit will have some feedback when I hit something. Oh, no, hang on. The pile of shit is the pulse grenade, because this thing is actually useless. Not only does it have a time delay before dealing a majority of its damage, but it fully relies on the enemy AI being dumb enough to stand inside the blast radius when it detonates. Even the vehicles could do with some improving. The Warthog feels a lot heavier than the originals and doesn't quite catch the same amount of airtime. Not that I think, from memory, there was ever a time where I drove the Warthog with someone actually manning the gun behind me. I think I drove the Warthog as a vehicle once. Even when the game threw a tank at me, I can't say I enjoyed that section too much at all, because it was basically driving in a straight line, corner peeking any unlucky motherfucker waiting for me. Oh, and the biggest gripe for me? What happened to the art style? Art style is eternal and graphics are temporary. This is a universal truth when it comes to games. So when you've established the art style of a semi-low sci-fi setting, and you want to throw it out the window in favor of a more sleek and high-end sci-fi setting sort of aesthetic, I have questions about that decision. Sure, the Covenant has some sleek designs to them, because they're more technologically advanced than everyone else. They've got fucking grav lifts while humanity is still using standard elevators. The human equipment had a much more boxy and industrial design to them rather than the sleek and clean look of the Coveys. Even Master Chief's armor, boxy, blocky, Maybe with a few clean lines, sure, but the armor absolutely makes him look like a brick shithouse on legs. The new armor doesn't even look like it would properly protect him from some random covey or Promethean shooting at him directly in the chest. It's far too smooth. I don't like it and they don't even give a reason as to why the armor changed between games. Oh wait, no, sorry, they do give you a reason. In a fucking dev interview. If you don't explain a change to such a noticeable part of the game, in the fucking game itself, why has it been changed? I'd be cool if the armor changed partway through the game, maybe when you link up with the Infinity, that'd make much more sense than it just magically happening between games. I'm not done by the way. The Didac. People. Working, people, needing a paycheck to feed themselves and their families had to go through the trouble of designing this character writing up a basic background, and then throwing together dialogue for the voice actor to read out, weaving them into the cutscenes to sell this completely new character as the key antagonist. You meet him twice, once when he's introduced, and again when he's removed from the plot. Not killed, removed, just to be killed off in a comic book. I feel like 343 tried to make the Didact such a powerful and threatening forerunner and antagonist that he spun all the way back around into being a complete show pony. 
He can lift Master Chief up like a beta version of a Sith Lord, but he never actually poses a threat in the plot. He makes a showy effort of controlling the Prometheans and swaying the faction of the Coveys we've got roaming around. But the dumb son bitch still doesn't instantly murk Chief when he literally can't move. Doesn't help when the only damage you deal to this little bitch is in a cutscene, without any real build up to it that's straight up given to the player. You don't work for it. You hit a button to make it happen. You probably think I don't like this game so far, and don't worry, I dislike the soundtrack even more. Let's be clear on this. The soundtrack itself is quite nice. A good comp. There's a good selection of songs you can pick out in the listing. There's parts of it, however, that either 343, Microsoft, or the composer himself, Neil Davidge, felt necessary to copyright, making any video that wants to talk about some of said composition in a critical sense subject to a copyright claim and utterly murder the traction that video might have. Again, to be clear, I think the composition itself is nice. There's some banger tracks in it, but I can't actually show you much without nuking the potential growth of this video. Talking about the soundtrack is very much my crutch when it comes to making these game critiques, and when I can't show you a song that's a prime example of, say, how the Halo 4 soundtrack lacks the distinct Halo feeling that Marty and Michael ingrained into the franchise, adding a little bit more of the military drums and trumpets into the mix, or how, generally, the soundtrack has a much more somber and downplayed feeling to it rather than a sweeping feel of the triumphant hero we know it to be. So, instead of the original soundtrack, I'm going to spend a minute talking about a substitute soundtrack that I've been filling out this video with. The album Wilderness by Wirebeats. You can find it on Spotify. I'm using it specifically because it sounds pretty similar in theming to the good old style of Halo we know and love. Now, granted, it's an overall more chilled out feeling compared to the intensity Halo can bring with it, but I think this can suit the quieter parts of the experience, when the map opens up a little and you're given a nice open vehicle section to meander through. The deserty ring sections from Halo 3 come to mind for me personally. Remember when I said I can't show you much of the actual OST Halo 4 is meant to have? I can find a single, one, lonely fucking song that I can play without too much fear of a bonking, Helps that I think the song itself is actually pretty good. Nowhere. From memory, can I recall anything like a military trumpet or drum rolling related to the other Halos? It absolutely separates this track from the rest of the composition, and unfortunately that's something you're going to have to take my word for. The trumpet in particular is something that sticks out to me, probably because of the Anzac days I've been to in my life. Hearing those trumpets flicks my mind into the realm of an event being a bit more official than it otherwise might be. I don't know, that sort of trumpet tone? Something that trips me back into a military setting, I guess. I do have one massive complaint about the sound aside from the soundtrack being copywritten. There is an offensive amount of audio compression going on in this game, and that's coming from a YouTuber who's been using compression in all of his videos for the last few years. Whether it's a problem with the mixing itself and sound effects not being leveled properly relative to everything else, or if 343 had an intern come in for a test run at the audio editing and then forgot to delete that file, who knows, but listen to this and tell me this is exactly how it's meant to sound. Chief, watch out! While we're here on sound, let's talk about a part of the game that won't get me in trouble. The overhaul of the weapon sound design and beat for beat sound effects littered through the journey of Halo 4, starting with my favourite, the sniper rifle. He do be sounding nice and meaty and powerful. Shh. 
Shoutouts to the dearest boy, my DMR, having a much more powerful report than his younger brother in Halo Reach. The shotgun, as well, has a much chunkier sound to his shot compared to the older entries. And if there's ever a gun that every game needs to get right, it's the shotgun. The newer weapons from the Prometheans, however, suffer from the same problem the original Covenant weapons had, in that they all have a distinct lack of impact. But I can give these boys a pass because they're fancy particle-based shooters, so my expectations weren't too high to begin with. We must be getting close to the pylon. If I had to pick just one promi weapon to keep, it'd be either the knockoff shotgun or the binary rifle just because it feels like there's some actual feedback between shooting the enemy and their bodies disintegrating. Concerning the Covey weapons, I don't like the new sound for the carbine. It's the reload. Something in my head says, nah fam, this ain't it. I could talk about the Storm Repeater, because if there ever was a stereotypical pew pew plasma gun, it's this one. If we keep talking about the weapons and the actual gameplay loop, we might actually shift over to the gameplay section before I ramble on a bit too much like an itty bitty Dumbo. Halo doesn't have the revolutionary gameplay loop it used to back in the day. This much is as clear as winter's morning. Halo 4, however, doesn't do a whole lot to change that developing trend as we march towards the latest entry in the franchise. The one new thing I enjoyed about Halo 4 from the gameplay loop was only in a half-hearted manner. The section at the end with the broadsword fighter. That was pretty cool on a spectacle alone. But if I wanted to play something that was largely on rails, I'd play a decent rail shooter, like Time Crisis or some shit. The rest of the game, as far as playing it goes, was pretty meh. The zero G section at the very start of the game was kind of cool, gave me a bit of a flashback to the similar section at the start of Halo 2. The opening vista once you land on Requiem is a nice visual, too bad the Warthog section that it takes place in doesn't do too much. The only other time you get a nice, big, cool vehicle to use is the Mammoth, but you aren't actually driving it. You're controlling the mini Mac cannon it has. Granted, you still get to destroy stuff with it, but manual control of that behemoth, like you get with the tank? Oh boy. There is the newest vehicle in the form of the Mantis Walker, because 343 heard you liked exosuits. So now you've got an exosuit to go over the top of your exosuit for your super soldier. If you call this tin can a mech, you need to go watch some Gundam or some Macross. It looks like a stiff gust of wind could topple this thing over and it would have no way to get back up. The machine gun does nice work though. This is probably my biggest nitpick with Halo 4 as a game, let alone a Halo game. The series has never had a good formula in place for when it comes to structuring their levels. Shooting gallery, walking, vehicle section, walking, set piece, cutscene. A lot of the sections that involve killing aliens in the larger Halo franchise rely on the setting and situation, the backdrop of what you're actually going through. When I can dumb an encounter down to three waves of enemies before a cutscene and a new area, that's me stripping away that important setting and situation that makes the fights in Halo a bit more memorable than its competition back in the day. So when I say that there genuinely isn't a single gameplay related section outside of the on rails broadsword moment that I thought was fun or interesting, take my word on it. I can certainly remember some parts, the door defense with the few marines in the jungles against the Prometheans was alright, uh, the short section with the tank and the mantis when you make it back to the infinity was alright, um, the bits where you point the laser for the mammoth before that thing gets knocked out, uh, the escape scene was the with the ghost. That was that, that was pretty okay. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all I remember. 
As you might be able to tell, it's hard for me to talk about things I just feel meh about. Hate it? Easy chat. Love it? We'll be here all day. Middling, however? Now I'm gonna have some trouble. The intro into the Prometheans themselves could have been a little bit better. Like, oh no, it screamed in my face and it looks like a human skull. I wonder if the Promethean Knights could be repurposed humans, probably, maybe, potentially Tee. At least when you pick up their guns for the first time, it's got a pretty neat little animation of the gun coming together. Those are pretty cool. If only the guns themselves had a bit more impact in the sound department, maybe they'd be my favorite over the redesigned Humi weapons. Oh, while I'm on weapons, here's a tangent. I was playing on Heroic, as you'd expect watching this series throughout, and I found the Needler in this game to be borderline broken. Like, this thing is too efficient. It feels like its homing ability has gotten a big upgrade between the other Halos and Halo 4. Like, fuck me, these elites, they, they don't stand a chance, they're fucked. The Master Chief, however, has shrugged off one of his weaker habits. Mainly the player flinching out of a zoomed in view the second an enemy sneezes in your direction. This is useful for sitting in the back line and sniping every bitch dumb enough to step into your view, which is something Halo 4 lets you exploit in almost every arena. Sitting at the back with a binary rifle and plugging away at Promethean Knights isn't necessarily engaging, but it's much more viable than trying to burst them down with the suppressor or the assault rifle and go in for the melee. That's how you get killed quickly. Comparing the Knights to the Elites, I'd rather face the Elites in every level. The Knights feel that much tankier thanks to their teleport, which subsequently makes killing the fuckers seem like an extra effort compared to their Covey counterparts. Credit where it's due, however. Each of the Promethean enemies you can face in your playthrough complement each other rather well, on the trade-off that it's almost an annoyance. So you've got the Knight, Crawlers, and Watchers. They all combine to have a pretty nice blend in the moment to moment. Watchers can nullify your grenade throws and flick them back at you, as well as raise shields for the knights, while knights themselves are the one damage dealer you're desperately trying to avoid, on top of being a moving spawn point for watchers if you give them a chance to kick over. There's a point to this. Trust me, the crawlers are the speedy version of grunts, with a much higher fire rate and more likely to get into my face the moment I step into a combat zone. I'm pretty sure I killed more of these little some bitches from melee than I did from gunshots. The problem with this loop is that Watchers can spawn both Knights and Crawlers respectively, so if you're too busy being tied down from the bigger and quicker lads, these little shits are going to keep you in the fight for a lot longer than you want to be. The more astute among you may have already picked up what I'm putting down. The Watchers are absolutely top priority, because if they can spawn more of the painful units if left to their own devices for too long, you can bet your ass I'm nuking them before they've got the chance to even blink. This helps keep the player on their toes in combat, but it does make the whole dance of a firefight a little bit more tedious when you can't quite nail a knight before they spawn a watcher. And while you're dealing with the big bitch, the watcher went ahead and spawned a pack of crawlers to keep the pressure up and boom, time for a checkpoint. Yeah, I've got issues with the Prometheans as enemies in this game. To be clear, I think it's a good idea to add in a different enemy to the franchise at this point, because you can only tweak and modify the Covenant so much before that well runs dry. But, had the communication between the art team and the programmers been a bit clearer, we might have gotten an overall more polished and less skewed combat feel. Because trying to snipe out these little flying bastards just so you can proceed can be annoying when you can't find a precision weapon. Kinda like how it feels that the narrative was being pulled in two different directions at the same time. To be straight up, Halo 4's story, at least one half of it, is something I actually enjoyed. The other half, I didn't care for in the slightest. The plot thread with Cortana degrading and experiencing rampancy, Chief trying to get her back to Halsey and letting his emotions slip through the mask he's built up over the years of combat, that's something I'm cool with. Trying to play the Didact storyline at the same time and introduce another main villain that you're hoping to build another trilogy around and completely ham-fisting his larger involvement by both having him not pose any great threat to the player, but falling directly into the shitty category of antagonist that is too powerful for the protagonist, but too stupid to actually try and kill them before it's too late. If you've played Halo in order so far, you've seen the first three chief adventures. You know who Cortana is. You know that these two characters have a pretty tight working relationship that's developed over the course of a pretty deadly war for humanity. So it entirely makes sense that when his core partner is dying in her own way, 
Master Chief, John, the dude who's had his sex drive completely neutered to make him a more effective soldier, is going to be a bit concerned about his favourite girly. I know I brought up Chief's sex drive, but let's not talk about that shit right now. I want to enjoy good things while I can. I did not, however, enjoy the didact. The concept is nice. A forerunner waking up and fulfilling his purpose of nuking humans? That's a good start. You fucked it up when you added in his entire backstory into terminals that most players probably won't care for. Because if you properly wanted to characterize your villain, maybe make that development a core part of the arc the player actually witnesses. Also, maybe don't let this main villain that you're trying to set up for a trilogy be killed off in a comic that, again, most players probably won't care for. This is a problem that's indicative of most of the 343 Halo games. There's more than a handful of story elements that should be critical to the overarching story and tying it together that's been tucked away in the extra material. Which instead of being a nice bonus to discover down the line when you've become invested in the lore behind the games, they've been shoved front and center as mandatory reading to understand exactly what the fuck is meant to be happening. That is not how you construct a good story. If I need to watch a specific developer interview just to learn how Master Chief's armor was upgraded between games, you've fucked up. Explaining it away with Cortana simply saying, I made some upgrades, is such a weak substitute that a wet noodle would hold up to more analysis. Remember when Halo was just about shooting aliens and you didn't have to read three ancient tomes worth of knowledge to understand the idea of what the trilogy was going for? Covenant bad, some of them are eventually friendly. Big ring bad because big killy. Flood bad because big killy. Me big armor dude, me kill aliens and flood good to protect humans. Weak version of big ring make flood go bye byes. That's easy shit. I just summed up three games for you. Now the plot has turned into we need to get Cortana to Halsey so she can make a new version of her, even though Cortana was found in a Forerunner ruin on Reach, so that Halsey can cure her rampancy, which is an aspect we've never heard of before in Halo. But we can't get off Requiem too fast because there's some mischief afoot with the Covenant being here and that whole gravity well scenario. The Prometheans are a nice curveball, and in the process of finding a good point to send a distress signal from, you wake up the Didact, who could easily crush you, but doesn't, because there needs to be a game. So now you've got to find a way back to the Infinity, which is a pretty big ship that crashes, and is immediately assaulted by the Didact, so he can find the Composer. What's the Composer? Well, it's this big thing that the Didact can use to digitize a human's very existence into code on a large scale letting him remold them into the Prometheans or some shit. And when they actually show it off, it's pretty cool. Quite impactful, I felt. <laughs> Too bad it's nullified by Master Chief being given the mantle of responsibility by the Librarian a few minutes ago. I want to say that if I get some details wrong, I really couldn't give a shit. So Chief has the mantle or some shit now and we're buddy buddy with the new captain of the Infinity because the last one was an authoritarian pussy. To surrender that AI! But we can't get Cortana to Halsey even though it's been made clear that that's kind of a critical thing for her continued existence at this point. First we gotta kill the Didact and nuke the Composer and the only way that's happening is by literally using a nuclear warhead on a broadsword. Still my favorite sequence aside from the door defense until said broadsword crashes. By the way, the composer is over Earth now, that place that's meant to be pretty heavily defended. You know, they kind of made a pretty big deal out of that at the start of Halo 2, that it was, you know, they were ready for a fight. So you crash your broadsword into the fucking composer and Master Chief, like a Chad says, don't worry fam, I'll just carry the nuke in there. Then Cortana does this little splitty thing three times and then you get a quick time boss fight and a final cutscene with a big boom and big feels and oh no, Cortana's totally dead, teehee. And finally the fucking game is over and Jesus Christ. In the six hours it took me to finish this game, I enjoyed maybe four or five moments in that runtime. The initial reveal of Cortana and Chief, again, thanks to the impressive mocap and Steve Downs knowing how to convey emotion through inflection in his voice. The defense of the door against the Prometheans, one of the only good combat moments the game had to offer. 
the initial outburst Cortana has when you crash land on Requiem and her later outburst on the Infinity with Del Rio being fucking stupid, flying the broadsword, like I keep saying, and the final conversation between Cortana and Chief at the very end of the plot. Because fuck me if it was cliched to all hell, I still enjoyed that moment because I played the other games. I know the path that these two have walked. Master Chief is as much of a mascot for the franchise as Cortana is. And the fact that this game was meant to kill her off is a plot point that has so much potential for the future. And they completely fucked it. The Cortana emotional plotline by itself, good. The Didac plotline by itself, middling. The two of them trying to be balanced in a single game rather than either or being the core focus, not good. Hiding plot details inside of interviews, side content, and extra media that's not even in the game? Colossal fuck up. There's good bits inside of Halo 4's story that you could legitimately build a complete narrative around, but the one you get in the final product is half-baked. I hate the didact. I'm fucking done. I know that chapter title might feel like a curveball, but it's true. I like Halo 4 as a game. I just have a lot of criticisms to throw at it. The gameplay loop doesn't evolve in line with the new enemies you face in combat, but the new weapon animations are nice. When they do the molding together thingy, that's pretty cool. The functionality of the new weapons is largely hollow aside from the rocket launcher. That thing is a bit overpowered. The Promethean enemies have a feedback loop with how they complement each other in combat. One that drains the air out of my lungs on higher difficulties because of how rapidly the Watchers can create new spawns for both knights and crawlers. Making a small, flying enemy top priority and a pain to deal with if you're lacking in any precision weaponry. Cause if you run after this little shit, the knight it came out of is going to smack you. The Mantis is kinda cool. The soundtrack, from what little I've noticed being implemented, is certainly a soundtrack. Not to the mark of Marty and Mikey but a soundtrack that can exist inside of the Halo universe, to be sure. Nothing too bad, but nothing outstanding. Too bad I can't show you large chunks of it thanks to copyright, but hey, can't win every battle you fight. The narrative is both my favorite and my least favorite part of Halo 4. The seeding of emotion from the Master Chief and having a bit more of a character-driven storyline with Cortana is a good storyline. One that brings up a good line in Halo 5. Don't worry. I've got some words for Halo 5. The potential contained in Cortana's plotline is good, but it's hampered against the attempt to balance the Didax part in what's meant to be a new trilogy for Halo. And it's not helped out at all by the amount of additional information that's either obscured in terminals or outright left in extra media that most players won't look for and won't care to know. Halo 4 is absolutely towards the bottom of the series rankings, but it's not in the worst spot. Oh no. The worst spot goes to the next one. Oh my god, the next one. You know how I've been doing these little bits in front of the intro this whole series? Yeah, nah. I have this brief moment of reflection when I finish a game. Was it good? Was it bad? Do I recommend it? Would I die on a hill for it in a Reddit forum? You know, standard gamer thought process. It was in this moment of reflection that the thought struck me, hmm, what if the worst part of Halo 5 is the fact that people actually had to develop it and put it on their resume? There are people walking around in the games industry looking for work that have this game credited to their names. I have no doubt they'd be proud of the work they put in, but I feel so sorry for them it couldn't come through in a better end product. There are stages to playing a bad game. First, you'll be overcome with a sense of what I call what the fuck itis. You're watching the game do its thing, playing through the moments you've been set up for, but then something, somewhere, will make you say out loud, what the fuck? Halo 5 did this to me in the very first cutscene. I didn't know that Super Sentai had such a powerful impact on the sci-fi gaming genre. If you don't know what Super Sentai is, you, my gamer, are uncultured swine. If you're going to try and tell me that Spartan Locke and these other poses aren't Power Rangers, they literally wipe out a mini Covenant army in this opening section in a cutscene with no input from you whatsoever. If you wanted to sell that this new crew that we've had zero introduction to and build up for is actually a competent and cohesive team, 
maybe let the player kick the shit out of an army this size, rather than just watching it happen with zero input whatsoever. Remember when I brought up the change in art direction from Halo 4? From relatively low sci-fi to extremely clean and shiny sci-fi? This whole opening is indicative of that change. Instead of having, I don't know, the Master Chief steadily picking his targets and bursting down enemies in this sequence like a trained soldier would do, these wannabes are just rolling through these enemies like that fight scene that you make in your mind when you're staring out the window of a train. Just me? Okay, then you fucking normies. The next stage of what the fuck itis is anger. Red hot, virile, screaming anger. This happens when something completely out of left field occurs before your very eyes, normally coming from a plot standpoint. There's a distinct moment where this happened to me. The cutscene after the second mission, where Ronald, Lasky, and Halsey, plus side character, are on the infinity. I'm going to read back to you, verbatim, exactly the words I said when this moment hit me on stream, because it's some good flaming hot shit. I managed to bruise my ribs today, and this is less painful than this. Yep. What is a Spartan hub? Um, options menu. And also where you customize your Spartan for multiplayer. Yeah, f shut the fuck up. No, 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 no. Who's Roland? Why do you only have one arm? Why are we talking about Cortana? She's dead. Why? Uh, uh, What's the domain? Why are we talking about the Forerunners game? Where's the Didac? The Didac was in the last game. Why isn't either the antagonist in this game? Why are we bringing back Cortana as a fucking insert villain? Is it because we miss Blue Purpley Lady? Why the... Why... What the... What the fuck is this game doing with itself? These are the words of a man actively experiencing pain. Anyway, there's something else I need to bitch about while we're getting this hate off my chest. Halo is classed as an FPS, a first person shooter. You know what levels in an FPS game normally entail? Shooting, lots of it. Generally speaking, presenting a plot in a shooter without bringing the player to a crawl in movement speed is something the age-old wizards have been trying to figure out since before the dark times. Halo 5 doesn't even give it a respectable hack. There's literally missions in this game where you just walk around and push X to talk to people and not shoot a single thing in that area. Even the opening to several missions involve a prelude that prevents me from immediately killing things. I play shooters to shoot things, to engage in the dance of priorities as different enemies are thrown at me, to navigate the environment in such a way where the enemy's numbers are turned against them so I have the advantage rather than them. It's quickly deciding which weapon best suits the situation or whichever death dealer still has a bit of ammo left in it whatever ability you have coming off cooldown to make it a bit easier to force fuck the enemy into the fiery pits of hell. I don't play shooters to be given a cutscene, followed by an in-game briefing and a short trek before getting into the combat I actually want to enjoy. Nor do I play them for entire levels to be solely built around weaving a flimsy plot together and providing a bit of scene dressing in the best case scenario. There is legitimately one thing that I think is good about the gameplay of Halo 5. They added a button to switch seats in a Warthog. This is the moment that I'm going to mention that I played Halo 5 on normal because I couldn't buy the game on PC, so I didn't want to play it on Heroic. And playing any shooter with a controller is already enough of a handicap without committing to a higher difficulty. If this tweak in the difficulty offends you given the rest of the series has been played on Heroic, you can play the game yourself and witness its horrors firsthand. Your suffering will be adequate compensation. While we're on the semi-gameplay related section, because I'm not sectioning this shit out as well as the other videos, the elites. What happened? Did the entire race get hit with a lethal strain of botulism between games? The elites are meant to be a proud warrior race, focusing on being speedy, graceful, yet strong in their fighting, especially when it comes to hand to hand with that energy sword. So why can the Spartans run rings around them and make it seem like they're all wearing a pack of cement shoes? Let's pick on Vale for a bit. This moment in the opening cutscene, old school elites probably would have fucked her right up 
And then again, when you find Halsey with her missing arm, Vale should have been pimp-handed by this dude. There's been so much kneecapping and slowing down of what used to be a landmark for the series of a great shooter genre that it feels like an amateurish student project that was given a blank check for its budget. And can we talk about the fucking music for a moment? Firstly, Kazuma Junochi, good composer, does good work, plenty of tasty music in this game by his hand. Secondly, genuinely okay composition, leaning a bit too hard on the strings at times, but by and large, a good experience for the homie. Thirdly, the trials. That's the best bit of the entire composition, and I will die on this hill. You know that brass chord in the background, and Kazuma has blended and formed it into the newest style of 343's Halo to fit with the much more overblown and over-the-top scenery this game has to it. If you're going to try and tell me that this piece doesn't belong at a climactic battle or a desperate chase scene slash escape sequence at the climax of Halo 5's experience, you're lying to yourself. It fucking smacks. A blending of the old and the new in the best way. The almost overwhelming use of grand rolling drums and strings, however, is a slight on this soundtrack's better parts that it unfortunately can't escape. Genuinely, strings have their place in action compositions, but not to the volume or repetition that they exist in the Halo 5 OST. I'm reasonably certain this track, this one track, Cavalier, was used about four or five times in various combat arenas. And it's accompanied by a few more of its kindred, like another six tracks that have a heavy, heavy reliance on strings to carry the body of each individual song. The thing that hurts about a lot of these songs that are guilty of abusing the strings is that, at least in their beginning on the OST, they're actually pretty alright. Case in point, Covenant Prayers. It has that nice, full-bodied chanting that feels right at home in a Halo soundtrack because, well, George and Choir is a part of the canon as far as I'm concerned but then it gets completely fucked by the strings. Do you see what I mean? Strings are good and absolutely belong in both a Halo composition and an action composition in general. But when you prescribe a double dose of such a lethal poison, it drags down the rest of the composition, not to mention the damage done by the story. Oh my Jesus. Let's talk about the story, shall we? Level with me for a moment, my gamers, because I have something that happens to me when I'm playing games. If I'm playing a game and I'm enjoying it, I am much more likely to excuse or ignore cracks or seams in the plot or gameplay loop, just from the fact that I'm having fun in the moment to moment. I'm being entertained enough to supplant a more critical eye and not nitpick out every little misstep I can find in the game. And trust me, if I go looking, I will find nitpicks. This, by and large, is what happens with most games whilst I'm playing them. This was not the case with Halo 5. The exact opposite to what I've just described happens when I'm not enjoying something, and I start noticing and complaining about a lot of the finer things that ultimately, honestly, don't matter. As far as Halo 5 is concerned, why do the Spartan helmets not sound like they have a pressurized seal anymore like the old games? Who the fuck is Locke looking at in the pelican from the opening cutscene when everyone else has already jumped out? 
Why does Halsey have a picture of Miranda Keys in her room in the opening cutscene? Why is Cortana here in Halsey's room and not in the Forerunner ruins on Reach as shown in the storyline for Reach itself? Why are the elites moving so clumsily and slowly? Aren't they meant to be elegant and powerful warriors? Why is there six new characters I've never seen or heard of before? Why do I have companions sticking to my ass and barely making themselves useful in combat? Why is the reveal of Cortana in the main plot first shown in the most piss poor silhouette and allusion to in a cutscene just for the full reveal to happen over radio? Why is Cortana back to begin with? Why is there so much bonus material that ties directly into the core story of Halo 5 that is somewhat important to understanding what's even happening? Why is Halsey here? Genuinely, she of all people doesn't need to be in these games. Why are there areas in this game that have you standing around and listening to people on the radio as a core way of explaining the plot before every mission? Why is Buck, a now Spartan, randomly moving this one box? Why these last two combat rooms? Why does the game continue after the CG cutscene with Cortana and Blue Team? Why is the lone boss fight in this game the Warden Eternal? repeated so many times that it makes him look like the AA clinic's favorite client. Why don't Master Chief and the Arbiter have the best bro moment in all of gaming at the end of this shitty story? If the answers to some of these questions are tucked away inside of terminals or books or comics or lore or whatever, then my question is, why the fuck isn't it presented directly to the player if it's critical to understanding what the fuck is going on. I finished Halo 5 in a single sitting, not because I was having fun and operating on a high. I finished this trash fucking experience out of spite for how joyless and numb it made me feel. To quote myself from the live stream, that just reactivated my high school depression. That line specifically was right after firing the sniper rifle for the first time. Me thinking that this is a sniper rifle, They've always sounded good in Halo. Surely, if they got one thing right, it'll be this. Man, the DMR sounds nice at least. <gasps> My baby. Hey, baby. Okay, if this sounds trash, I'm going to be very ha unhappy. Uh. Oh. Uh. Oh. Uh. My faith was misplaced. Are these criticisms a result of my beforehand knowledge of this game reviewing poorly? Potentially. Are they the fostered child of my displeasure with Halo 5, making me examine every aspect of this game in a much more critical light because of how little fun I was having while playing it? Oh, I'd be willing to put money on it. But Hellfire, being the reviewer you are, surely you have some positive remarks aside from the soundtrack for Halo 5 Guardians. Surely, over the six hours of your life you've thrown away for the sake of this singular entry in the franchise, you would have found some good stuff in that. Well, aside from the Warthog seat switch button that I mentioned earlier, it does a great job at making Halo 4 look a lot better. I also hear that the multiplayer was very consistent goody good sorts of good. Aside from the very, very stupid inclusion of the rec packs, not the fact that you can change your look in multiplayer, that's whatever for me. The fact that you can spec loadouts with buffs over the baseline weapons, creating an inherent gap in damage and range between the people who either pick up the game day one, or were willing to throw money at it, and the people who dived in far later than everyone else. Microtransactions that affect gameplay are never okay. Um, other good things about Halo 5. I have not a single doubt in my cynical and overactive mind that there's a collection of people out there that would call Halo 5 their favorite game in the franchise. I envy those people. I envy their ability to have fun in spite of the inconsistencies and motivation to enjoy a piece of media for the sake of enjoying media. They probably get along great with the same people who like the TV show. To check off my personal list though, I don't like the gameplay because it feels disjointed, lacked impact, and padded out valuable playtime with missions and sections that didn't actively involve shooting or engaging a set piece. Probably not helped by the fact that I couldn't play this game on my PC, and using a controller 
specifically for a first person shooter, makes me feel absolutely disgusting. The soundtrack cures this disgust, at least partially. There's good bits and pieces, but they aren't aided at all by the shit weapon sounds, which were so offensive, not only did they reactivate my depression, I didn't even want to talk about them. The shotgun sounds alright. Then there's the story. Here's what playing through Halo 5's story garnered as a final note in my little notebook that I have every time I play a game when I was done playing it. Quote, One of the worst games I've ever bought and played. Unquote. At least we know what the flaw for quality is moving forward. That's the funny thing, moving forward, moving into the future. Because you don't really know what to expect as you're moving into it. And when it comes to Halo, what lies ahead took a fair while to get going. Was it worth the wait? I guess we'll have to find out. Holy shit, do y'all want to talk about a comeback real quick? Whoa, 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 whoa. easy there, big guy. Welcome to the status report. fam i'm hype to gush about infinite because <laughs> oh my god it's so much better than halo 5 but first something rather important to infinite it's rather on brand quite frankly fucked development halo infinite started its development in 2015 right alongside halo 5 being finished up and as the old saying goes when you've hit the bottom the only place left to go is up 343 thought that up meant outsourcing and signing on contractors to help develop what is going to be the final halo one that they just add on to with separate campaign expansions and make that fat bread off the multiplayer outsourcing in the games industry normally isn't anything too strange major publishers do it all the time to cut costs and save time on the next big release that probably should be developed for five years but it needs to come out in three Halo Infinite, firstly, needed an overhaul to its engine, so 343 smashed together a few ones and zeros and made the Slipgate engine. That's what you've got to thank for the pretty decent visuals Halo Infinite carries along its runtime. I like the fog and smoke effects personally, it's very volumetric is the word I want to use. The first big, big road bump in the development that I can narrow down was the departure of Dan Ayub, Ayub former executive producer at 343. That's lingo for Dan was essentially the boss, and then he left. Normally an executive producer, ideally, to my knowledge, is meant to steer the ship in the right direction when production of said ship goes off track. To keep a honed in vision between the game director, the programmers, the artists, etc, etc. They're meant to keep everything on the relative straight and narrow. However, reports would indicate that the development during this time period with Dan at the head was a little bit troubled. And by troubled, I mean they restarted development in 2018. Three years of work was almost completely yeeted out the window. Remember when I brought up Slipgate? Part of that being chosen as the guts for Halo Infinite was not only because of the pretty pretties so Xbox owners could justify paying a lot of money for a shiny plastic box, but also because Slipgate made it a lot easier than older engines to integrate new assets and updates as it was developed for Infinite. Too bad they apparently can't update the co-op, eh? The more avid and learned fans among the audience will probably remember that Halo Infinite was first announced all those years ago at E3 2018. Here's a fun fact. That entire trailer was outsourced to a contractor who had only 18 months to work on it thanks to Microsoft's policy on external contracts. And it wasn't developed with the goal of being a good showcase for what Halo Infinite would look like. 
It was made with the intention of pushing every pixel as far as it could, just for the one trailer. And then they did it three more times, and still outsourced every single one of them. This trailer from E3 2020 was entirely outsourced to another company, and was still made inside of Slipgate, but only to leverage its full graphical power for the six minutes it runs for, and not to showcase what it'll actually look like for the 16 odd hours you'll be playing Halo Infinite for, just to finish the campaign. Even that infamous 2020 gameplay trailer, the one with the almighty Chieftain Craig himself, in-engine, outsourced, solely for that trailer. Minus the environments, they actually kept those vaguely for the actual full game. Leveraging whatever engine you're using isn't something that should surprise you, however, because most games you've played recently probably used the exact same trick to some degree. Quite frankly, this research gave me a flashback to when The Witcher 3 was announced. Now, I like me some Witcher 3 in my life. I'm down for some Slavic fantasy shit, and I'll openly point out that this, even with mods, don't look like the quality that's in this trailer. You know what else gives me flashbacks? Halo Infinite. To times when the gameplay wasn't boring. There's a thing that Halo 4 and 5 to a much greater degree largely lacked on the point-to-point -point campaign. Fun. So, with that little thing in our minds, I propose a motion to track down the person who pitched the idea for the grapple hook in Halo Infinite and force 343 to give them a fat fucking pay raise. Provided they're not part of upper management, cause fuck them. Movement in a shooter is pretty critical. That's why the retro shooters you see littering Steam have a heavy focus on that one element. That's why top flight competitive games like Apex Legends and Valorant rely on both map knowledge and knowing how and when to outmaneuver the opponent, as well as why a bunch of more recent AAA shooters are a lot faster than they used to be a few short years ago. Movement is even more critical if your shooter takes place in an open world or even a semi-sandbox. Like, imagine for a moment how bad Infinite would be if 343 thought that adding a grapple would have been a bad idea. That's the death of Halo right there. Trying to move around this map without it? Calling it a chore is me being gentle with my language. Sure, you'd have the vehicles that are all pretty alright for getting around the map, but the moment you run into one of the many mountains, or any of the number of the pillar things, whoop. While we're on the open world, it does feel a bit strange being in a Halo game, but it's not something I'm entirely against. I can see the side of wanting a more honed in and focused experience that plays a little closer to the Golden Trilogy, or even Halo 4 in terms of the levels themselves. Putting more work into the missions would, logically, result in a more enjoyable mission structure and the ability to tie in more set pieces to make your game all the more memorable. Then again, I can see the opposing side as well, leaning into the open nature that we kinda missed out on in Halo Combat Evolved, because while that game did have big levels, you couldn't explore too much without glitching and breaking the game a little. So taking that sandbox potential that Combat Evolved had and just expanding it out a little bit, to the point where you can sprinkle in little side activities around the map that feed back into upgrading your character for the main missions is something I can get behind. Do I think the open world is boring sometimes? Yes. Would it have been much worse without the grapple as the prime movement option? Oh, fuck yeah. 343 even flirted with the Ubisoft trap of open world design, clogging up the map with a bunch of useless shit. And by flirting, I mean towing the fucking line mighty, mighty finely. You could do without some of the random audio logs in the middle of nowhere and the propaganda towers. I'm okay with the ring artifacts and audio logs inside of the missions though. Tie the valor progression of the fobs as you liberate them, the camps you can destroy and the squads you can save or assist in the open world. Then still have the assassination targets scattered around for the bonus powered covey weapons because there's actual incentive to tracking those assassination targets down in the corners of the map. The armor lockers could be thinned out and the Spartan cores keep them as an exploration thing that you can find on the map if you want them, but still keep a healthy amount of them in the story to upgrade the chief properly. Let me give you a bit of video whiplash and take us back to the weapons because, oh lord, there do be some lead slingers in this game. Let's start with the basic stuff. <gasps> AR, good, much more accurate than the other games, feels weighty and in a good spot as a mid-range pew pew. <laughs> Extended range model doesn't feel needed in my opinion. 
The pistol, the sidekick, baller pistol, hyper accurate. Headshot only runs are saved thanks to this beautiful thing. The striker variant is even better in my opinion. The BR. I've missed you, my friend. Super good, point and click and the enemy is dead. The Breacher variant loses a bit too much accuracy for my liking, but that's the trade-off you get for increased damage. Bulldog, very suitable shotgun. I like its design instead of just being another breech load or tube-fed pump action. This magazine pump stuff, on side. Indifferent to the convergence model. I like the paint job. Spanker, beautiful. Tracker Spanker, yes. Brings back the lock on. Fucking love it. Hydra, usable is the word. Effective against banshees, but I'd rather pick up a different gun when it comes to infantry. Didn't use the pursuit variant that much because the baseline wasn't that great to begin with, but the description makes it sound pretty okay. Commando, sometimes feels a bit too accurate in my opinion. Is a good gun, does good work, but feels like sometimes a headshot is missing by a pixel. Impact variant is a nice change, but I'm still taking the BR and pistol setup over picking up a commando. Then there's the S7 sniper. My true son has returned from vacation and brought a nephew with him. This is how a sniper rifle should sound. The Flexfire is the nephew, by the way. It's nice. That's just the human weapons, by the way, and I didn't even mention the vehicles. Nor the Covey weapons. Actually, I should call them the Banished now, shouldn't I? Pulse Carbine. Eh. Rapid Fire Variant. Eh. Plasma Pistol. Eh. Unbound Variant. Eh. Needler. God Tier. Pinpoint Model. Kinda fucking useless for the one fight I remember using it. Skewer. Fucking overpowered in terms of its damage and the size of the model taking up a third of my screen. Volatile variant. Straight up cheat code. Spawn a few, give them to marines, then take a razorback around for a drive-by. Shock rifle. Good. Solid. Quite like it. The purging variant. Eh. Mangler. Nice little shotgun pistol thing. Feels right at home as a sidearm for the brutes. Good to rip headshots with. The riven version. Less so. Much closer to a shotgun than before. The Cinder Shot, I suck at using it. Doubly so for the backdraft model. Ravager, don't know, used it once, didn't like it. The Heat Wave, certainly a gun. Disruptor Pistol, an absolute bitch in the hands of an enemy when you're trying to fly. Pretty useful in your hands though. The Calcian model, peak, baller, beautiful pistol. If I can't have my striker, I'm taking this thing instead. Sentinel Beam, milts everything pretty good. Arcane model, Twice as good, love it even more. Energy sword, most certainly a melee weapon. Grav hammer, definitely a melee weapon. Normally carried by an absolute bullet sponge of an enemy. I just rattled off about every gun I can remember using in my playthrough. Could it be that playing through on heroic for the sake of consistency and brownie points might have colored my opinions on some weapons? Probably, but I just don't care. Most of the guns are good. They feel good to use. They kill enemies real nice. And even if they don't feel great to shoot, they are still usable in different scenarios. I also think that having the little mule grunts walk around and just be a thing in most areas of the map is a very good idea. Cause what if I don't want to pick up a shitty plasma pistol? What if I want an actual weapon? Chances are that little grunt I just domed probably has a decent weapon strapped to his back. Side note. I did this pretty sweet bail thanks to some grunt with a disruptor abusing the accuracy buffs on heroic, so I'm gonna show you that before I keep rambling. I didn't even mention the power coils. Oh, these are so good. Grapple, coil, yeet. So simple, so satisfying. I hope I'm getting across that I enjoyed playing Halo Infinite. I like the gunplay, the combatty batty, the pew pew, the alien killin'. I didn't really use the power ops that weren't called threat sensor or grapple. The drop wall, nah, this ain't it. I'd rather grapple out of a situation if I'm in danger rather than dropping cover. And the thrusters were a bit too weak for me to really get behind. 
Once upgraded, sure, usable, but the grapple is faster. Make no mistake, without the grapple, Halo Infinite would be a boring game, and the combat would suffer its departure just as much. I'm not fully on side with the open world being constructed in the way it was, but I do like it a bit better than the tightened up and super linear style of gameplay that 343 saddled you with in Halo 4 and the other one. One thing all of the 343 attempts have, however, is a good soundtrack. A point not too often brought up by yours truly when it comes to soundtracks is the implementation of a song versus just listening to it in isolation. A track can sound perfectly fine by itself, but its impact and musical acumen might falter when examined in the context surrounding the specific scene or moment it's presented in-game. Whether it's surrounded by character dialogue, left to carry a cutscene on its own, or if it's a long repeating loop that plays for specific combat sections. Does the song in question add an underlying emotion that you mightn't consciously register, enhancing the intended effect of the cutscene it's coupled with? Does it genuinely heighten the feeling of the moment in combat, or is it drowned out or overshadowed by the feeling itself? I once said that a good comp can be a good comp, but a great comp is one that grabs my attention and forces me to notice its presence in the gameplay, on time and on target. Thankfully, Halo Infinite has a few of those. I mean, how could I not notice it? The fucking trek up to meet the big bad that has been fruitlessly taunting you the entire game, and you get to roll through this valley, packed with enemies, in a fucking tank? This is good shit, bro. Credits to the composers for Infinite. Joe Kolitz, Curtis Svetzer, and Gareth Cocker. They've done some mighty fine work across the two and a half hours worth of music that accompanies you in your journey from top to tail of Zeta Halo. They even sidestepped the ever-present trap with existing franchises of leaning too heavily on older compositions as a cheap callback for an emotional kick, targeting that older bit of the fanbase who will recognize the tunes by ear the moment it's played. To be fair, I do the exact same thing at the end of my videos, so meh. In this track, however, The Road, they've brought in that classic brass and strings arrangement and just laced a bit of extra percussion on top of it. I'm not quite sure what sort of drum they've used, but that little bit of hollowness in that drum that leads towards a bit more of a tribal beat. That's some good stuff. Even finishing it off with a little flourish that modifies the original timing of the OG Truth and Reconciliation Suite from Combat Evolved, which was 21 years ago, by the way. It's not like the soundtrack is only carrying weight in the back half of the OST either. From the opening, the very, very good opening, the music was worming its way into my brain as something I would enjoy listening to later, even if it was buried beneath a few filters to make it sound suitable for the moment it was needed in. So, I'ma play the song itself first, then fold it into the moment it's used in the opening, and you'll see what I mean. First impressions are important, this is a universal truth, and the first impression that Halo Infinite gave me was that my attention is going to be fairly wrapped around this game until it's over. 
Then about six days passed where it was the only game I really played for extended periods of time. I've probably said this in the past, but it's something that I'm going to repeat and reiterate on. More reviewers need to talk about the soundtrack to the games we play, both as a standalone composition and how they tie into the action and cutscenes, to help sell both the story and gameplay independent of each other. Even when the music is very, very subtly being played in the background beneath a layer of voice acting, it's still adding something to the scene it's playing alongside. Because if there's a cutscene that would have legitimately been improved without the score backing it up, I have yet to see it for myself. Is it getting across to you that I not only quite like the soundtrack, but how it was implemented into flowing in and out of and around the story beats as you play through Halo Infinite? No? Okay, one more quick example. Just to sell you on the idea that even a small flourish of a composition can make a world of difference when it comes to elevating a moment in the story above what it otherwise might have been. I don't know how else I can put it, honestly. The game is good, the soundtrack is good. The story has holes I can poke in it. Now, I do know me a bit of Halo lore, because it's a pretty rich subject when it comes to YouTube videos I can use to enlighten myself on the matter, but, I don't think people should be expected to know said lore for the sake of understanding the story you're trying to tell. Halo Infinite leans pretty heavy on knowing the lore, to even understand who the throwaway antagonist of the campaign actually is. If you don't know the basic lore behind Halo Wars 2, you won't know who the fuck Atriox is. You'll just know that he shit whips Master Chief in the opening cutscene, then dies off screen. This happens a few times as you roll through the happenings planned for your playtime. And don't think for a moment that I won't level the same criticisms I had for Halo 5 at Infinite, just because I had more fun actually playing through it. What's the Endless? Who are the Banished? Are they just Discount Covenant? What the fuck are the Skimmers? Who the hell is Atriox? How did Cortana get to this ring? Who the fuck is Weapon? I mean, obviously she's a clone of Cortana, but they did such a piss weak job of trying to veil that fact, I don't even know why they bothered. Why did Cortana change from blue to purple? Kinda like how she changed from purple to blue. Who the fuck is Spartan Griffin? Where's Lasky? Where's Fireteam Osiris? Where's the rest of Blue Team? All but one of these questions I just rattled off to you aren't even answered in the campaign for Halo Infinite. 343 must have it written in their contract somewhere that they absolutely must, against all reasonable sense, reference the external material of Halo when making their games. Because it doesn't matter if someone's completely confused on the story of the game itself. We need to sell those extra comics, novels, and spin-off games so they can actually understand the mainline title. That said, however, there's a few moments inside the telling of Infinite's story that I enjoyed, and a few more that I wholeheartedly think are a better example of humanizing the Chief than early attempts in Halo 4. The moment immediately after finding Weapon and you see those little ghosts in the next room, one of which I assume is meant to be John himself when he gets that famous number. The moment when you jump after that one boss battle and Echo 216 catches you midair, even though judging off the height of the cutscene, Chief should have been in for a hard landing rather than a smooth catch he got, but eh, it still looked fucking cool. The conversation between Echo 216, also known as the homie, Fernando Esparza, and Chief when they get shot down on that island in the middle of the map. Special shoutouts in this moment to Nicholas Roy, doing both the mocap and the VA for Esparza, 
giving what I think would be probably the most emotionally charged tantrum in the Halo franchise. Crushed. Broken. Beaten. Useless. Enough. When? When is it enough, Chief? When we're in there? Because that's where I belong. In there. With them. Worthless junk. Not this. I'm not you. Double shout outs to Steve Downs for doing Steve Downs things and showcasing a subtle manipulation to the tonality and the weight he puts on certain words as he speaks. It's good stuff. The semi-retcon moment towards the end of the plot that canonized the Mjolnir Mark VII as the armor chief war during the ending of Halo 4, keeping it in line with the already established look and feeling of the larger Halo art style. For what it's worth, I like the new direction for the armor, still boxy like the old school stuff, but still customizable and a bit more modern than said old stuff. The best moment, to me however, is the little exchange between chief and weapon, very much towards the ass portion of the journey. When the chief, the armored up space marine super soldier that we've killed thousands of aliens as, strips down as much of those emotional guards and years of wear that being a career soldier would give you and spouts off with context one of the best lines in the entire fucking franchise. We do it together. <sighs> Can you trust me? I don't. But I want to. Is it as quotable as other moments in the broader series? No, I need a weapon. Were it so easy? For a brick, he flew pretty good. What, what, what? But as a line that represents the progression of a character that's had six games to develop and grow so far, pretty good. Couldn't tell you what else happened in the story though. I think the Endless are older than the Forerunners, somehow. Um, there's no more Spartan 4s because their training place got blown to shit by Cortana. The Brute homeworld, or at least Atriox's homeworld, got blown up by Cortana, so he's pretty mad about that. Um, Cortana blew up the ring in a change of heart. She's also had her third final goodbye to John because apparently 343 has trouble committing to goodbyes. Um, the new Endless antagonist looks like a more squiddy version of the Elites, so I wouldn't put it past 343 to tie that in somehow. Uh, Escherum, who I also called, quote, a scrotal sack looking motherfucker, is a pretty weak villain, but at least his boss fight is passable. Oh, by the way, you know how the larger part of the game spends a good deal of dialogue trying to tell you that Atriox is dead? SPOILERS! If you played Halo Infinite and didn't know where the story might go, don't worry, I don't have a fucking clue either. 343 might know where they're taking it, but it'll rely on their narrative decisions and how hard they want to splice the story into extra media, or maybe even the multiplayer seasons. As far as I can read on the subject, it looks like we might just be getting a few more adventures as the Chief in the form of DLC expansions for Infinite because Microsoft and 343 consider this to be the final Halo game and apparently have a 10 year plan in place for content. Judging how that plan is going so far when it comes to the multiplayer, I don't foresee this plan sticking in place for too much longer without a bit of miracle work from the dev crew. To quickly speak on the multiplayer side of the game as well because it's very much not what I focus on when it comes to games. 343 has a lot of work ahead of them to make this multiplayer suitable for the modern day. The games I've played with friends have been pretty fun, but rolling shit down a hill can be fun with friends. The games I've played solo haven't even been in the same neighborhood of fun. Very much a multiplayer I might play a game or two of a day if the mood strikes, but it's not something I'm no lifing. To be quite frank about Halo Infinite, there's a lot of basic stuff that's missing that I would normally expect from a fully developed game with a multiplayer mode thrown in. The lack of decent experience based off the challenges for multiplayer. The majority of the battle pass consisting of challenge swaps. 
the lack of an in-depth and usable custom game search in regards to playing a specific game mode on a specific map. Even from the single player side, the lack of a mission select for replays is a big kneecapping. The lacking of something as fundamental to Halo as co-op in any form being missing from the game is a reason for me not to recommend you play it. Halo is a series known for its multiplayer scene and the co-op from the campaign. One is absent from the game and the other is in a pretty deplorable state. I can't lie however, what I played of the single player was enjoyable. I had fun from the excellent opening cutscene to the closing credits at the end of it all, as much as the final stretch started to run out of steam. I liked the open world, as much as I would rather a Halo game trim back that aspect a little bit to keep the spirit of where its roots lie. I thoroughly enjoyed the soundtrack, in isolation and implementation. Moments of the story would ring a lot more hollow without its inclusion. On top of that, there's specific songs I can pick and choose, completely removed from the game, that are still nice to listen to. For all the nitpicks and criticism I can throw at the wall, I liked the narrative. A lot of questions were left unanswered, and a few more sprung up the closer I got to the finish line. Yes, but if my enjoyment is to be measured off the moments of the story that I thought, yeah, good, then we've got a successful narrative. At the very least, the narrative makes the shit show of Halo 5 look a lot worse. If I was going to put Halo Infinite on an arbitrary scale like every other gaming site, it's a good 7 out of 10. Above the average, with enough that I liked that I didn't care for the time I was sinking into it, but also having those little touches and bits of detail that mightn't matter in the larger scope, but do add to my enjoyment. The keeping whatever weapon you have equipped into the cutscenes. The chatter from the grunts and marines that reflect which campaign mission you completed most recently. Little touches like the pistol Esparza gives Chief in the opening cutscene, having only one bullet in it. I'd be willing to bet Esparza was saving that bullet for himself. Little touches are the dashes of herbs and spice to the larger soup of the campaign. I'd recommend Halo Infinite on the conditions that you're a fan of the Halo franchise, or it's on like a 40 to 50% discount. Considering that this game is sitting across from the Master Chief collection, 80 bucks is a mighty big ask for this one. And with that, we're done with Halo. Whether the next adventure is a DLC or a completely separate game with the Chief being the front man once again, we're not going to know until it's here. But for now, this is what we got. As for what's coming, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Thanks to my members for their gracious support during this series of videos. Their patience has been a blessing for me. Shoutouts, collectively, to the beautiful people. Cres up cuz, Claire, Maya Hairbear, Sir Thor the Swede, and John. Y'all, lovely people. Thank you for your support. I'm going to release one final Halo video. A big old mashup. A supercut, if you might. That's gonna be a big one. Subscribe to the channel and keep an ear out for that bit of background noise. It'll come... Probably pretty quickly after this one, honestly. When that supercut releases, I'll be having an end-to-end -end stream of Master Chief's journey. Combat evolved through to infinite. Omitting Halo 5 because I fucking hate that game. <laughs> I'll be over on my Twitch for hopefully the entire duration. Whether you swing by and say hey, or if you want to challenge yourself and stick out the stream with me, either one will be pretty cool. But we'll be running through all of it. Combat evolved, two, three, four, infinite. One sitting. It's gonna be like... 32 hours or some such bullshit. <laughs> and this is where editing Tez chimes in to say, uh, actually, we're also going to be playing ODST and Reach in chronological order without stopping one big old stream. And it's closer to, if I play the games quick, 58 hours. Because by the end of that shit, I'm going crazy. Um, once that's done, uh, I'm definitely taking a break once the supercut is out and that stream finally hits the can. So expect that. Um, until then... I don't know what videos I'm going to make next, but I've got I've got an archive, so I'll see you in the next one. Ciao.